You ready? You ready? Good afternoon, everybody. We're sorry about a two-minute delay. We had some technical difficulties, but I'm going to call this meeting of the City Council work session uh, to order here in City Council Chambers on Thursday, February 9th. It's about, uh, 2023, and it's about 1.02 p.m. As the manager was walking in um, a few minutes ago, she said that we needed to, I need to check on Hillside High. That school is currently in the middle of a situation. And so as we come to this moment, I ask that we just take a moment to think about what happened on yesterday. What is currently happening right now as we begin to conduct today's business here that we have to conduct. My heart is really heavy. Um, and just kind of um, in your own way, let us get a better world, picture in our mind, a better world for our students here in Durham, particularly um, Hillside High at this moment, and how we can actually realize that. Madam Clerk, if you will call the roll. Good afternoon, everyone. Mayor O'Neill. I am here. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. I'm here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Holsey Hyman. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. And Councilmember Williams. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of announcements. One that we need to make fairly quickly um, as people are are counting on us to be efficient and, and move things along. And this would be in reference to our, our budget retreat. Uh, because of a conflict that we missed, we are asking now at this point, I think all of the council has been uh, notified that I was going to make the ask today to move the budget retreat the first day to March 2nd. And we will also have it followed up by another budget retreat meeting on March uh, 3rd. Uh, I don't think we need to vote on it, but we do need to have a thumbs up from all those who are in agreement. Thank you all. It's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. So now I do want to um, tell you about, we have a very robust um, agenda today, all of us up here on the dais will be taking part in how we uh, conduct this meeting today. We all have various assignments uh, to carry out portions of this meeting. But I do want to uh, let you all know that I've, I've gotten a couple of phone calls um, from folk in the community that have been concerned about the uh, decorum, I guess, that we are conducting ourselves in or not. And I just want to ask everybody to be conscious that how we think we may be appearing to people in the public's eye, and there are a lot of people watching us on the internet as well as in person, that that perception um, being rooted in one's own mind may, may be subject to differences in opinions as to how we appear to the public. I know all of us are hardworking public servants, and this job is by no means an easy job. And I am, was not quite used to people talking to me in, in such a manner as I have experienced being mayor. But at the same time, I also recognize, as my mother used to tell me, Elaine, your, your tongue is mighty sharp. You need to watch that. You need to curtail that tongue sometimes. And as a lawyer, you know, you're kind of trained to do that in a lot of instances. And it, as a judge, it can, it can come off as brutal and unemotional because when you have to sentence somebody to life in prison and you need to say that with a straight face and make sure that they understand you, that can almost come off as dismissive or emotionalist. So I've tried to be cognizant and try to put some virtues out there every month for us to kind of think about as to how we interchange as individuals with each other and with the 
public at large and to try to make sure that we remember that we are working for you all. We do work for you all. And so with that comes a certain amount of pushback, and it should. That's the beauty of our democracy. That's why I like America. Um, that's why I like the United States. I like my city. I like all of it. So there is there there is some pushback that comes from people that elect you. Um, and so we have to be cognizant that some of that comes with the job. But I do want to ask my colleagues that we be mindful that how we, we may have people who differ with how we think or how we um, vote on different things. But let us not make them feel that they are being demeaned by the process of asking and pushing back. And that's a fine line on how you do that. I just want to raise it as a concern because I've gotten at least three to four phone calls about it. And I want people to, you know, be aware that the public is watching. They want us to, they want to be able to come in here and voice their concerns. And there's a certain amount of advocacy that goes on. And we too have a right to advocate for our positions, but let us do it in peace and harmony uh, to the extent we can. We got a lot of stuff going on in Durham and some of us not pretty right now. And so we don't want to be in here arguing and fussing when we, we have bigger issues to think about as we do this job. So let's just be mindful of that. So um, at this point, I am going to pass it over to any of my other colleagues for any announcements that they may have um, this afternoon. I'll look to my left first. Councilwoman Hosey Hyman. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon to my colleagues. Good afternoon to my residents. Um, I would just like to say that I had the honor yesterday to attend the 18th annual Durham City Council Martin Luther King Employment uh, um, uh, Program. And our very own uh, Wanda Page, our city manager, brought the purpose and she did a wonderful job. And it was just really so nice to see also the young youth who are from Jordan's Orchestra who also performed. And so it was a really nice occasion. It was my first time attending and just wanted to say that that it was it happened and it was like the 18th annual. So this has been going on for a while. So it was joint city and county. And then uh, again, happy uh, Black History Month. Um, and because of that, I wanted to just kind of spearhead and honor um, someone by the name of R. N. Harris, who was the first Durham black elected city council member. And I'm just gonna read just a little bit that was actually after he was appointed, I mean, excuse me, elected. This was reporting on his election in May of May 9th, 1953 in the Carolina Times. It finally happened after nearly a decade of fruitless attempts by several Negro candidates to obtain a seat on the Durham City Council. A Negro was last elected to serve as the governor body. And so I, I, I actually am able to stand on the heels of all of my colleagues, but definitely stand on the heels of the first black um, elected city council <laughs> member. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Jose Hyman. Are there any other announcements? Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have submitted a little bit after the deadline, apologies, um, a resolution in support of our LGBTQ community here in Durham um, as we deal with some really harmful legislation that's going through the North Carolina General Assembly right now. Um, due to the speed that this legislation is progressing, I will be asking my colleagues to suspend the rules and vote on this resolution today rather than wait until um, our Monday night meeting. One of these bills has already passed the Senate and is moving very quickly through the House. And I think it's important that we um, express our opposition to this damaging legislation and our solidarity with our LGBTQ plus uh, community as soon as possible. So I'll be asking for that at the appropriate time later in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Johnson. Councilman Williams. Thank you, Madam Mayor and colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, it's, it's been an emotional couple of days uh, and I just, uh, once again, would like to just reaffirm um, just my commitment and, and others to um, supporting uh, the effort of saving lives as much as possible. And with that being said, I've sent notice to uh, Superintendent Mubenga 
Uh, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton has agreed to join me, and I'm sure that we can get others, uh, hundreds of others who've already committed. It's time for us to go directly into our schools and speak with these young men of color directly. Um, when I was teaching, I used to see the writing on the wall. And I could tell you, I could tell my students almost their life based on the trajectory that they were, you know, uh, performing there in front of me. And I would say, hey, you are going to end up here, or you're going to end up here. However, you could end up X if you change these habits. And um, I'm not in the classroom anymore, and that's one of the things I miss most about it, because teachers save lives. And uh, I hope that, you know, we can lend whatever support possible, uh, but I think it's time to get proximate. And, and I plan to do just that, um, get into these schools. Um, I am praying for the families of those who lost uh, or those who actually have young men uh, or youth that are in situations where they are on the brink of doing something that doesn't value their own life. And I hope that we can start catching it well before it actually happens. Um, with that being said, I'll also be asking the council to consider hearing a uh, brief presentation um, from the folks that are running Built to Last as well. Um, I don't know if we do that now or, or later, but I'd like to invite them in to give an update on where they are, not from a departmental standpoint, but from an actual organization uh, standpoint. And I'd love your support in having them come in to provide that. Thank you so much. You, you have definitely have my support on all the above. Um, I was over at Hillside last week. I plan to try to make a visit over there real soon. Uh, I was in touch with Dr. Logan and uh, in touch with my kinfolk who are uh, students at that school. And yesterday was a lot for them, um, a lot for all of us. And, and it, it just has to stop at this point. We've got to find a way to stop it. So I just turn to my left, let me know when and where, how I need to do whatever. Turn to my right, see if we have any announcements on this end. I'll, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, there's a child that's not going home and it's just difficult every time. Um, I think it goes without saying that as a council, we're supportive of the children, um, but I am very mindful that these issues in a very holistic way start from birth. And the work you can do in high school is impactful, but the work you can do from birth and prenatal is even more impactful. And there are uh, lots of organizations in this city that do that work. And I just wanna lift them up and saying like, there's equity before birth. There's um, Durham Children's Initiative. There's, uh, I mean, there's so many, and I think in COVID, there was a, a falling away of volunteers, a falling away of a lot of in-person activities that are necessary right now. And I wanna call on all of the folks in our community, as our mayor once did, to say that it's time to get out here and um, to get roll up your sleeves and figure out how to support these children and their families. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Madam Mayor, thank you so much. Good afternoon to you, ma'am, and to my fellow honorable colleagues and to all in chamber and who are watching or wherever you are. Madam Mayor, you have, I mean, you, you, you channeled the voice and the heart of the city as is your unique role um, in light of what's happened uh, at Hillside. I, I'll just simply say, I wanna associate myself with everything you've said and my colleagues have said um, and, and just put this fine point on it. With all of the accolades and detention that Durham gets, um, whether it's DPAC or having the highest per capita PhD rate in the country, one of them, with how many companies are moving to us, with all of that stuff, which is all true, as long as our kids are killing each other, it will always be a muted celebration. This is an editorial on us big grown folk. In the final analysis, it's not those kids, this is an editorial on us. I don't know how we're gonna to respond to it, but this is about us in the final analysis. 
So as we celebrate how great our city is, um, it will always be a celebration with an asterisk as long as this is going on. May God bless the family of the young man who was taken from us. May God bless Hillside. May God bless our city. Madam Mayor, I have one ask um, of my colleagues. We know that we have been dealing with, with staffing and, and salary issues with a number of departments in the city. And our, we know that 911 uh, responders are the first voice that people often hear. Not often, they are the first voice that people hear when they call, when they are in, facing some of their most challenging and darkest hours. Uh, I've been um, in communication with the North Carolina Department of Information Technology uh, and their legislative liaison uh, office. And I'm going to ask our colleagues at the next work session to consider a resolution entitled the First Responders, the First First Responders Resolution. Uh, other cities have taken it up. Uh, it's winding through le the legislature as now, uh, as we speak. It's a resolution to recognize the value of 911 telecommunicators in their role in North Carolina public safety for responding to emergency calls from citizens of the state and dispatching those calls to first responders in the field. And I asked uh, for unanimous consent for my colleagues to put that on our next work session agenda to look at and, and look at it and uh, look at it and see if we want to uh, add the voice and imprimatur of the city of Durham to it. Changing this long term, there's no appropriation attached to it in the short term, but long term, changing this designation uh, of first responders, of 911 uh, call takers to first responders, will put them in a position uh, for differentiation in terms of um, participation in our pension plan, uh, compensation, um, and I think will help us. Uh, here locally as a municipality in making sure that we're staffed with the, with the best people, best trained people, best compensated people. So I ask for that to be placed, uh, to look for my colleagues to look for that from me and for it to be placed on the next work session, work session agenda in accordance with our practices uh, to have something placed on the work session agenda. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You have your thumbs up on that. Yes, go ahead, Councilman. Williams. Also, uh, March 1st is the meeting, the convening with the Planning Commission and Council members. Um, it should be on everyone's calendar, uh, but it's March 1st at, I believe, 6 p.m. So that means we have pretty much, uh, like Ms. Wallace told me today, you all have back-to-back -back meetings now. It is. Meeting Sorry about that, guys. First, the second, and the third to carry out the people's business. All right, thank you all. I'm going to ask Mayor Pro Tem to carry us through our priority items. I'll come back and read through the agenda and then it'll switch back over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem to carry us through our pooled items and then our other city council folk will be jumping in on the presentations we have this afternoon uh, and we will move efficiently. With your permission, Madam Mayor, good afternoon once again to everyone. I'm going to ask now, uh, yield now to our city manager for any priority items that she may have. Good afternoon, Madam Manager. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, Madam Mayor, and members of the Durham City Council. I have only one priority item for your consideration, and it is agenda item number 54, the 2023 long session legislative and advocacy agendas, a supplemental item that has been added. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Manager. Your item is noted. At this time now, I'll yield to our city attorney for any priority items she may have. Good afternoon, Councilor. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, the city attorney's office also has one priority item. Um, I sent a memo on this to the council earlier this week. It is that at the close of all regular business today, city council recessed a closed session in order to um, consider a matter in litigation. The motion that is needed is to hold a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143. 318.11A3 for attorney client consultation concerning the handling or settlement in the case listed below. In that case is Amanda Mingo as guardian ad litem at Al versus City of Durham at Al, and that is a middle district case federally filed in file number 120 CV226. If you'll take a motion. If you'll take a motion on that. Well, well, thank you. Your, your items are noted, and we will discharge of that at the appropriate time. I'll now, I'm sorry. I'll now yield to the city clerk for any uh, priority items she may have. Good afternoon, Madam Clerk. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I did want to remind you, you need to accept the city attorney's priority item. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. Okay. And also, um, there are some disclosure forms on the dias 
for the council members. We have had a public record request for those, so if you could please fill those out today, and I'll be able to respond to the public record request. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please, we have now heard our priority items. We have one action item from our city attorney uh, to for a motion to go into closed session at the end of regular business for this work session. She's already read the language into the record, so I'll entertain a motion uh, to go into closed session according to the language that our city attorney has already entered into record. So moved. I heard a motion from Council Member Freeman, and we'll take a second from Council Member Hyman. Madam Clerk, you can't open it. Uh, all it will indicate by raising your right hand. All opposed? The chair's opinion the vote is unanimous. We will go into closed session after our posted uh, agenda has been discharged with. Madam Mayor? Okay. We, uh, the city manager had a, was yours just information on a, you added something to a? Agenda set. Okay. The city manager's, thank you city manager. The city manager's item requires motion, uh, movement as well. Would you please uh, provide a motion for the city manager's item? So move. Second. Heard a motion from the mayor, second from council member Caballero. Would you please indicate affirmative by raising your right hand? Any opposed? Motion is unanimous. Madam Mayor, I think that discharges all of our priority items. All right, I'll go through the agenda and then you'll be ready for speakers and um, our public speakers today and our port items. All right, I will read through the entire uh, agenda beginning with item number one, which is the Durham Homeless Services Advisory Committee appointment. The Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee is item two. Item three, the Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee mayoral appointment. Number four, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee appointment. Five, the Citizens Advisory Committee appointment. Turning to our departmental items, item six, on-street, off-street parking performance audit, January 2023. Item seven, Audit Services Oversight Committee 2022 Annual Report. Number eight, 2022 Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority Annual Report. Item nine, the American Recovery Plan Act Opera Project, Durham Children's Initiatives Connected to Career Pipeline. Item 10, 2022 Durham Open Space and Trails Commission Annual Report. 11, 2022 Durham City County Appearance Commission Annual Report. 12, 2022 Board of Adjustment Annual Report. Item 13, 2022 the Planning Commission Annual Report. 14, 2022 Historic Preservation Commission Annual Report. Number 15, approval of a multifamily housing facility to be known as Hardy Street Apartments in the city of Durham, North Carolina, with the financing thereof with multifamily housing revenue bonds. Item 16, 2022, Durham Community Safety and Wellness Task Force Annual Report. Item 17, the budget amendments for certain CIP project ordinances HUD grant project ordinances, and <coughs> FY23 annual operating funds. Bless you. Item 18, cooperative group purchase contract, three something ex extreme duty custom plumper trucks. Item 19, construction contract with Bar Construction Company, Inc. for athletic court renovations, Piney Wood Park Pickleball. 21, service contract with Arbamax Tree Service, LLC, for right-of-way stump removal. Skip this one. Okay, let's skip one. I'm sorry, I skipped number 20, which is the Durham Cultural Advisory Board 2022 Annual Report. Item 22, the Durham Environmental Affairs Board 2022 Annual Report. 23, the Durham Convention Center Authority Board 2022 Annual Report. Item 24 is former Wheels Skating Center Upfit Design Contract with DTW Architects and Planners Limited. I think we have a citizen who's presented a card for that item. 
That's no, 24. That's not 24. 24. 24. Yeah. 24. There was one on the just read, it, just read it, just read it from mine. Okay. It's been updated. All right. The lease for RDU Presidential Park, West Property Owner LP for Durham Police Department District 4 substation is item 24. That's correct. Okay. You pulled that one? Uh-uh. We don't okay. pull that one. It's actually this one we have okay. to speak on. Item 25 has the speaker, which is former Wheel Skating Center Upfit Design Contract with DTW Architects and Planners L Limited, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. card. We'll check mark. Okay. Item 26, governing service agreements for on-call professional services, geotechnical engineering, environmental services, surveying, and cost estimating. Item 27, contract to perform energy audit services between the City of Durham and Alpha Facilities Solutions, LLC. Item 28, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee 2022 Annual Report. 29 is Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Agreement <coughs> to, for Adult Worker and Dislocated Worker Program, Eckert Youth Alternatives, Inc. Number 30, 2022 Recreation Advisory Commission Annual Report. 31, the 2022 National Police Athletic League Endowment Grant Project Ordinance. 32, 2023 Duke Doing Good Grant Program Ordinance. Item 33, contract SW-40C Construction Engineering and Inspection Services for South Austin Avenue Sidewalk. Number 34, contract SW-92 Sidewalk Repairs 2023. Item 35 is contract ST-322 Maryland Avenue Bridge Removal. Item 36, the interlocal agreement with Durham County for the administration and enforcement of sediment and erosion control requirements within the city of Durham. 37, contract SW-40 South Austin Avenue Sidewalk Project TIP number C-5183B. Item 38, Stormwater Infrastructure Repairs, SD-2022-02. 39, Fellowship Placement Agreement between the City of Durham and Fuse Corps for designing a sustainable solution to waste management project. Item 40, Contract Amendment with Granicus LLC, doing business as Granicus Success, LLC to upgrade the Granicus encoders and software. Item 41, the Second Amendment to purchase contract for six Gilag, uh, Gilag electric buses. Woo <laughs> Item 42, uh, 2022 Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission Annual Report. Item 43, the construction of a traffic signal at Hillendale Road and Horton Road. Yes. Item 44, Nutrient analysis, Analyzer Service Agreement with Hike Company. Okay, y'all know these braces are a little tricky. Uh, item 45, the American Rescue Plan Act Opera update. Item 46 is our affordable housing deep dive presentation in Durham eviction diversion on Durham eviction diversion program. Item 47, Go Durham, FY22 annual report. As for our public hearings, Item 48, zoning map change, American Village Townhomes. 49, consolidated annexation, welcome Venture Park. Item 50, the zoning map change at 1907 South Miami Boulevard. Item 51, a public hearing on use of home, H-O-M-E, home, American Rescue Plans, ARP funds, ARP funds. Item 52 is a public hearing on and approval of proposed amendments to the FY 2016 to 2017, 2017 through 2018, 2018 to 2019, 2019 through 2020, 2020 through 2021, and 21, 2021 through 2022 annual action plans. We also have a couple of supplemental items. Uh, item 53 is a presentation on single-use plastic bag fees. 
Item 54 is 2023 Long Session Legislative and Advocacy Agendas. Mm -hmm. All right. And item 55 is the resolution that we are being asked to vote on today in solidarity with Durham's LGBTQ plus community. Madam Mayor, I know that Councilmember Johnson's made a uh, recommendation or a request, but I was going to pull that item, so I, I'd like to actually have some discussion about that item. Okay. All right, that concludes the reading of our agenda. And so what I have for, for you to go through, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, is item 25, item 54, and item 55. Is that what you have, our city manager? I'm reading from your writing. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. All right, I'm turning it back over to you for our community comments, Mayor Pro Tem, Thank and you. to review our board items. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just before we uh, move, uh, Council Member Caballero pointed out to me that there seems to be a coding issue with item number 28, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee 2022 Annual Report. I'd like to bring that to the staff's attention. If you click on MHALC Annual Report, it looks like Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Agreement for Adult and Dislocated Worker Program Delivery between the City of Durham and Eckerd Youth Alternatives. My Spanish is not good, but that is most decidedly not, doesn't have anything to do with. I got you. <laughs> got you. Thank you. All right. We are, have pulled item number 25, uh, former wheels. Okay. All right. So there's also one. Okay, all right, I'm pleased to welcome members of our public who, who wish to speak on item number, twi uh, item number 25, this pulled item. I have a card from former council member uh, Jacqueline Wagstaff, who we welcome to the chamber, back to the chamber. And also item number 25, Shanetta Burr, so we welcome to the chamber. Each of you will have three minutes if you come to the podium, and if you'll state your name and address. For the record, you'll have three minutes. Good afternoon and welcome. I don't think it's on. Can you hear me now? Uh, back to item number 24. Um, when it coming in, I was here, seeing, hearing the doom and gloom about yesterday's events at Hillside, and I came prepared to speak on this item. And this item right here would directly be linked to what is needed in Durham for some of these youth that are carrying these guns. Unfortunately, the young man that was murdered yesterday was a senior. I'm not going to call his name, but I do know his name. Um, the family, I, I, I'm really speechless at this point to know that we have a school system that parents wake up every day, send their kids to school, expecting that these kids are going to be safe, and these are the results that we're getting. And like you said, Pastor Middleton, um, we have all these wonderful things going on in Durham, but we have a lot of bad things that are going on that overshadow anything that's going on right now that should be considered wonderful. So I can't really stand here and take pride in what's going on in Durham when I know this is going on every day because I work with these young people. And when we talk about some of the solutions, it can't be continuing to be just a whole lot of talk and a whole lot of lip service. Are any of y'all gonna go in that trail tomorrow and monitor? I come through there every day, and I see those kids coming through those trails, going to the store, going across the street, and I see that happening, and it worries me. Matter of fact, one day I actually went over to the school and talked to Dr. Logan about a bunch of kids across the street. I said, you need to have somebody out here doing something about it. But with this wheels situation, Wills, if anybody know the history, that was a location that East Durham, Pac-1, used that facility. That was a place where low-income individuals could do things with their kids that kept them out of trouble. I spent about 20 years doing summer camps, and Wills was my, like my twice-a-week place to take the young people to. 
It was inexpensive. It didn't cost us much. And we were able to go there and do things with families that a lot of things are priced out now. There's nothing down here that any of the families I work with can participate in other than walking down to Central Park and walking around in the park. There's nothing they can do. They can't afford it. You can't afford a burger down here. So this Wheels Park, I'm hoping that when this is completed, it's accessible to the population that lives in and around that community that had access to that park previously. Because when we start talking about aquatic parks, every body of water in Durham right now has a price attached to it. Campus Hill. Um, well, I'm not going to go any further, but I just want to say that this park is instrumental in solving some of these problems with our youth. Thank you so much, Ms. Wagstaff. And uh, Ms. Burris, good afternoon. Before you start, um, Ms. Burris, let me just say uh, my apologies. We went to the pulled items. We do have cards for folk who, uh, for Citizens Matters to be heard at once. So my apologies, you will be heard, those of you that signed up for Citizens Matters. And as soon as we hear from Ms. Burris, we'll, then we'll go back to our Citizens Matters at one. This, okay. All right. No, this is for 25. All right. Ms. Burris, I'm sorry. State your name and address. You'll have three minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tip, and members of council. My name is Shanetta Burris, 3701 Highgate Drive, and I'm here today to stand in solidarity with my PAC1 neighbors who are enthusiastic about the redevelopment of Wills Fun Park and the Aquatic Center. While there's enthusiasm about the redevelopment of this community space, there are concerns about community involvement in the planning process. As we continue to grow together, it's imperative that, the cons that concerned and interested residents participate in the process and that communication is clear. It appears that Durham Parks and Recreation failed to meet with community members in the months of November 2022 as well as December and January 2023, as they previously discussed. Moving forward, we hope that Durham Parks and Recreation will restore the practice of engaging with residents to foster trust and include them in the planning process. Moreover, community members have highlighted that the meetings are occurring in silos. For example, there are, certain, there are separate meetings for those interested in the Aquatic Center and those interested in Wills. We must achieve a comprehensive understanding of how the site will be developed and the input provided by residents is included in the construction and upfitting of wills. Residents more, more than a high level overview. Details regarding the construction of the aquatic center at the site are important as, folks, as we ask folks to collectively reimagine use risk community space. People are closely monitoring the RFP process and are seeking clarity on how the ideas and suggestions brought forth by the community are being implemented. Finally, as we are all aware, we are in desperate need of recreational spaces for young people, as well as people my age range, I like to skate too. So it's critical that we retain facilities like Wills and create similar places as well. I hope this council will explore innovative strategies to ensure that money is not a barrier for residents seek to utilize these spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. There is one more uh, speaker on item number 25, and that is Kelsey Monk. Good afternoon, welcome. If you'll state your name and address, uh, for the record, you'll have three minutes. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, <clears throat> Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. My name is Kelsey Monk. My address is 1302 Hudson Avenue. Um, I'm a second generation Wheels customer and a participant in the Resident Steering Committee such that we do meet. Um, I just wanted to call the Council's attention to the timeline and the contract that's up for consideration today. Uh, when we met in October of 2022 and y'all greenlit wheels, General Services said that they could get it ready in 15 months, um, and they outlined 11 core steps to do that. We're at step number three in their outline, and we're already a month behind. So it took about two years for the city to greenlight reopening wheels. I just don't want it to take another two years to be able to skate again. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all who spoke on item number 25. At this time, now we're going to turn to citizens' comments. Um, I have several cards. I'm going to read verse 5, and I'll ask that you would just um, come up in turn, state your name and address, and you'll each have three minutes. Uh, James Chavis, Pastor A. Wood Sr., Tiffany Swooper, forgive me if that's incorrect, Stacy Donahue, and the tray is good. Mr. Chavis, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. And Black History Month to all the black folks in here that's been through the struggle like me and so many others that really know what the struggle is about. I'm coming to speak on wheels since this is Black History Month. 
And black history month means that we need to look back and see where we've been and where we're going. Well, park and recreation on the way has not done nothing but discriminate against us black folks. You had a young lady already stated, we, we missed three meetings. We was not notified. You had his assistant, Mary, sent out in December that we was gonna have a meeting in January. We was not notified and we did not have that meeting. But come up in January for February, we get this report. The community co committee, North Park and Recreation, met on this report. We had no input on this report at all. But they're going to tell us, yes, we agree to what they said. Now, I've been going to the meetings. I didn't go to November because they didn't have one. I didn't go to December because they didn't have one. I didn't go to January because they didn't have one. <clears throat> so how can you come and tell us that this is what we accept and we did not know anything about it? Look on the last page, because I know y'all probably got a copy of it, and turn it over. Well, Mary sent an email out to us in December saying that we was going to have a, a meeting in January. Mary is white and I'm black. Now tell me who's lying, me or Mary. Tell me this Black History Month that I'm lying on a white woman against a black man. Tell me why should I be standing up here if we had that meeting? Tell me what's important to me being black and still struggling, the fight that was struggling right in this place way before I was born. And right now, we got all these black folks up here. And once again, we are fighting the steel struggle that we once thought before I was born. This is discrimination. Our rights have been violated. But you all gonna say, it's okay. I'd like to know, since you all been celebrating Black History Month, Councilman Hyman and all the rest of it, what about our rights that we did not get, okay? What about us that's been trying to take a part and making things right for the city of Durham? What about us? Mr. Davis, thank, thank you very much. Pastor A. Wood Sr., good afternoon, sir, and welcome. If you'll state your name and address for the record, you'll have three minutes. Thank you for being with us. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pastor Wood. Uh, I've had an opportunity to be here several times and not say anything. But uh, the young man that you're speaking about at Hillside I had a personal experience with this young man. Uh, I volunteer over in the Cornwallis neighborhood uh, with uh, Ms. Swoops. The young man had desires to be, to have his own business. On, in January, I called the police department personally and told them there was gunfire outside of that rec center. She asked me where, when, what, and how many. I said, I'm a pastor, I'm here volunteering. She said, told me, if I have any other problems, call her back. I told them that the center was on lockdown. One police officer did not show up to that center. So you have people in the neighborhood as well that are afraid to come out to let their children come to her center, that she's helping them herself. And you ask what we can do as a pastor, pastor, uh, people say the Bible tells us that people die for the lack of knowledge, right? Who's held accountable? Us, pastors, because we're not teaching our children. There's a documentary right now on YouTube. You say we're doing well, as Ms. Wag Matt Wagstaff said as well. He said that the worst place to live in North Carolina, Durham, was on there. All this other stuff you're talking about, Mayor Bell was in, was in office. There were some investors that rode around Durham, 
pointed out where they was going to tear down and break up before they built that center over there off of the Haiti Center. They spoke. They said, we got a 10-year plan for homeless. Well, they did two things correct. They built up downtown, the homeless still homeless. How I know? I was that bus driver that drove them around town and pointed it out. What can we do? Like she say, stop talking. Time to get up and start. I'm not throwing no stones, but it's time to start talking. Our children are dying. <coughs> Because you're talking about all these programs, one of the meetings I came here to, so he has some programs, he's going to check it out. I called uh, 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 Councilman Williams, said, talked about this King program. I called him back in January, asked to find out what we can do to help. I ain't heard from him yet. It's talk. So, Mayor, I'm on your calendar. Like I said, I'm not throwing stones, but I'm willing to help. And things that are not done, you'll see me again. I'll be back in this chamber again. These investors that you're talking about buying downtown, I watch police officers give tickets to people sitting downtown when I was driving the bus to tell them they couldn't sit there no more. Councilman Fr uh, Williams said as well, he's a part of this as well, drinking downtown, he ran us out. But you gave a license for those to sit. Time to get up. Pastor Wood, thank you so much for being with us. Tiffany Swoops. Good afternoon. If you'll state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes. Thank you for being with us. Hi, my name is Tiffany Swoop. Uh, my address is 600 Park Offices Drive, um, Suite 300. Uh, my speech has changed a little bit uh, due to the incident that occurred yesterday. Um, the young man who lost his life was very dear to me. I connected with him and worked with him personally uh, since last year when I launched my services um, at Weaver Street Recreation Center. And what I will say is um, he was a young man who had hopes, he had dreams, he had a goal of owning his own trucking company by the time he was 25. Immediately after finishing high school, he wanted to go to barbering school um, just to uh, start uh, his pathway into entrepreneurship. Uh, what I will say is we all are aware that Cornwallis is a very volatile community. It's impoverished. The people that, who live there have been historically marginalized. There's been a lack of services and resources afforded to that community during my time um, uh, uh, being resident at Corn um, Weaver Street Recreation Center. And I will also add, I am new to North Carolina, and a lot of things that I am very sensitive to here seem to be, have been normalized. Uh, these youth who are li losing their lives in the streets uh, day after day, they are not statistics. They are human beings. They have potential. They have purpose, and they could be uh, very resourceful pillars in the community if given a fair opportunity and chance. I am here to ask uh, that you all advocate and consider um, allocating funds to youth mentoring and youth services because it is very much needed. I don't care how much technology you install to uh, identify gunshots. If we don't have the resources to respond to those gunshots, to make these kids feel that they are safe in their community, to make these kids feel uh, that someone cares and to uh, have someone there to help guide them to that next level of life, the city's going to remain in a perpetual cycle of what we're experiencing today. Um, I will just want to say that um, mentors, uh, we bring people from the outside in. It's hard for me to get resources in. I've lost connections just as recent as last month because people from outside of the community don't feel safe within the community. And because the people who are living in the community are stuck in some trauma cycles themselves, uh, they don't have the time or the mindset to um, participate with what I'm doing, which is to break cycles of trauma. That's really the gist of what I have to say. We need resources. We need support. We need our city leaders to make uh, community-informed decisions, ones that are going to help, not help certain parts of the uh, community, but all demographics, uh, to give all demographics access to equality. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Stacy Donahue. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us. If you'll state your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Stacy Donahue. I'm with a nonprofit in Durham called Strong Her Together, and my address is 4209 New Leaf Lane. Um, I wanted to uh, be prepared to you today. I envision myself having statistics to talk you through and maybe a, a nice written out um, three minute speech. And I'm driving over here and I'm thinking to myself, why do I not have it together? What is, what is up? And uh, what, what was really up when I started thinking about it was uh, mentoring, because that's what myself and our leadership team and our volunteers have been focused on since the inception of our program, but particularly the last couple of weeks with an a initiative that we have called Village Hers. And Village Hers is a program that's designed to remove boundaries to extracurricular learning. Um, so I just want to share with you just a little snapshot of, of what we've been working on the last couple of weeks to give you some ideas of how mentoring is, is impacting youth that are involved in our program. Um, I want to paint a picture of, for you of the girls that we've been working with most recently. Um, right now, one of them is wearing an ankle monitor. Um, we have kids, uh, one has lost a brother and a best friend to gun violence. Uh, we have kids who are constantly evicted. We pick them up from hotels. Um, we have kids who have siblings that uh, become pregnant, move back home, and then kids in our programs are tasked with watching babies while siblings go to work. Um, just a lot of things that, that point to the fact that these kids are really on the precipice of a path that's, that's a virtual landmine of possibilities to fail. There's no question. Um, but there is a flip side to this, and it's, and it's a pretty cool one. Um, through, through the efforts of mentoring, what we've been able to see, and trust me, it takes some sleuthing because these kids that we're working with are not kids who are brimming with self-esteem and confidence and they want to tell you what it is that their dreams are about, right? But if you can get in there with these kids and do the work and the mentoring, what you're going to find out is this same group of girls, what their dreams are, they want to know about sports medicine, meteorology, space, law, photography, songwriting, same kids. And it's mentors who are having this opportunity to get in and show these kids that they do have a possibility that's different than the possibility that they've seen for most of their lives. So I would say to you, city council members, thank you for considering and, and voting for this legislation that's going to help us to move youth mentoring forward. Um, and beyond that, I mean, the opportunity for all of you for programs like ours at Stronger Together and the many more that we're fortunate to have here in Durham, along with school staffs, which are just absolutely incredible, for all of us to partner together and become these fierce advocates for these kids, that is a hope, I think, that all of us in this room have. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you so much for being with us. Atreus Good, good to see you. If you'll state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Atreus Good at 3311 Tarleton East. I lead an organization called Youth Mentoring Collaborative. We mentor mentors and mentoring organizations to help them be better at what they do. I did not know today would be mentoring day, uh, but I'm talking about mentoring and specifically from a personal perspective. For those that know my personal story, my mom struggled with drug addiction when I was growing up, and I was forced to deal with a lot of adult issues very early on in life. And my dad was there, but did not have the ability to provide me with the emotional support that I needed to move forward. And so it was my mentor through the Greater Charlotte Chapter of the 100 Black Men of America that helped me to move forward. Uh, the 100's motto is what they see is what they'll be. So the idea of visioning that is critically important to see people that look like you in positions of influence to see yourself in that space. And so I was surrounded by black doctors, bankers, lawyers, scuba divers, chefs, a broad array of options to help me understand that I could build a different future for myself. Eventually started a mentoring organization when I was in college and now doing work to help mentoring organizations be stronger. And I think that what's most important to think about mentoring right now is that we, we are shifting. And I think that COVID-19 uh, lifted up the veil on what we already knew was a mounting mental health crisis and young people struggling the most were black and brown students. And specifically, mentoring can be used to, uh, I guess, eliminate some of that mental health stigma, specifically in communities of color, because I recognize that uh, telling a young person to move forward and be successful is one thing, but arming them with the skills, so emotion regulation, distress tolerance, core mindfulness, uh, that is critically important to help them understand that we can all build a life that is worth living. 
And with everything that's going on right now, it makes it very hard for young people to move forward and be successful. And so uh, thank you all so much for supporting the Youth Mentoring Services Act. Uh, our agency, in a different name, introduced that to the General Assembly. And we had difficulty moving it forward because we did not have bipartisan support. And what I can say is that mentoring and having a positive, supportive uh, adult in your life should not be a partisan issue. I think that all young people should have access to people that simply can say, I care about you. I want to see you move forward and be successful. So whatever can be done here locally to understand that mentoring and having access to those sorts of role models, I would not be who I am right now had I not had someone that said, I care about you. But most importantly, allowing me to cry, to shed the bitterness, the frustration that came with my upbringing and build a different, a different course of life. And a lot of people, especially young black and brown youth, do not have access to mentors. And so whatever you all can do to continue to lift that charge, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Good. It's always good to see you. Uh, my last uh, card I have is for Katrina Brown. Is Katrina here? Good afternoon. If you'll uh, approach and state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes. Thank you for being with us. Hi, my name is Katrina Brown, and I stay at 2519 South Roxburgh Street, apartment 33 in Cornwallis. Okay. I am here to talk about the youth. Yes, I volunteer at the REC in Cornwallis. And, oh my gosh. <laughs> I just want to speak on my young black youth. No, they don't have a father figure. They don't have nobody out here leading them. So I just ask that they get any type of funds in that community to where we can help our young black men to where they can lead up to their personality and let them know this more than what they trying to say they is. And I am a mother of five boys and it's hard because I'm raising them by myself. Without Miss Scoop and the pastor, my kid, what if that was my kid at his that school? My oldest son go to Central. I'm scared for him every day. Every day, because he's young and black. I just need some guidance to help these young men. I can't do it myself. I'm out there every day with them. I can't do it myself. And I need help. Anything with a man, I need help with this young youth. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. We appreciate your, your comments this afternoon. Uh, friends, colleagues, I, that's all of the um, cards uh, indication I have of folk who were speaking for Citizens Matters. And we thank all of our, our residents and citizens who took time to be with us this afternoon uh, to let your voices be heard. At this time now, Madam Mayor, with your permission, we're going to go to item, uh, pulled item 54, and this was pulled by our honorable colleague, uh, Dr. Hyman. I'm going to yield to her. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, my colleagues. So I pulled this item because, again, um, and first of all, I just want to thank the mentoring programs that I have invited here today to speak to us. Um, it's heavy on my heart, too, because when I first met Ms. Tiffany Swoop, I literally went to Cornwallis and have been going to the program that she has there. And again, for me personally, growing up in the South Bronx in New York, one parent household, I would have never been able to be here if people did not wrap their arms around me and mentor me. So I pulled this item because I really would like to see the Youth Mentoring Service Act that we have on our advocacy list to be moved to the action list. As people are saying, we've got to stop talking and we got to stop doing. And I am very much, number one, a social worker by trade, but number two, a solution-focused person. And so we keep saying and we keep saying and we keep saying what we have to do. Youth mentor, it is evidence-based that youth mentoring does help with risky behavior. We looked at the State of Union address the other night from the president. And he talked about youth, he talked about substance abuse, and he talked about mental health. The President of the United States. So we have to do something here in Durham. We have to do something for all of our youth, but especially for our populations at risk. And so I'm asking my colleagues to be able to move this Youth Mentoring Service Act from the advocacy 
to the action list. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, anyone questions or comments? I'll have some comments as the chair of the legislative committee, but go, go for it. That was my question. I don't sit on that committee, so. <laughs> anyone else? All right, it, it, it's, first off, Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for, for your, for the passion and for the folk who have come out and spoken to us about it. I think it's important for residents and citizens to understand exactly what this is that we're doing. The, um, we as, as a governing board of, of Durham, of course, don't have a vote in Raleigh. And each year we send our list of priorities as a city, as, as mediated by us as a council, to our legislative delegation. And there are, two, there are essentially two designations that we send. One is action, one is advocacy. Um, they're not in any ranked order of which one is more important, but our action list are items that we are asking the legislature, our legislative delegation, to actually uh, draft legislation and try and enter into the process of it becoming legislation. Our advocacy list are items that are equally important, but that we're saying to them, mm -hmm. if in your judgment you see an opportunity to take the shot through your relationships with other colleagues, through your uh, just reading the, the, the lay of the land uh, in the legislature, to move on it. Um, it's very important that, that we're, not, we're not talking about the importance of mentoring. All of us understand it. All of us support it. All of us embrace it. I was impacted uh, by mentor. I had a father in my home, a very engaged father, but I also had mentors as well who partnered with him. So this is, I want, wanted to be very clear. This is not about whether or not we think mentoring is important or not. This is the machinations of the political reality of the state legislature. And, and what, we're, what marching orders we're giving our delegation in Raleigh as they see fit. Um, I have no problem moving it to the action list if, if colleagues want to do that, but I, I want folks to understand that the debate isn't the importance of it. One of the reasons why we differentiate our action list from our advocacy list is because, and it was, I think Atreus mentioned that there wasn't bipartisan support. Um, sometimes our legislators have to make a determination as to what fights to fight at what time. And sometimes fighting a fight, particularly if it's already been fought, um, fighting it again when you've got something else in play uh, may antagonize potential um, allies, may, may exacerbate efforts to get things done. So what we do, we, we say to our legislators, we trust you to read the lay of the land and determine when it's appropriate to take the shot or shoehorn this in. But these are the items who we, we're actually asking you to draft legislation on. And these are the other items that if you see an opportunity to do it, do it. And I think that's important to lay the land. So with that said, I have absolutely no objections if it's the will of the council to move the item from advocacy to action. But it's very important, I think, for our residents and citizens to understand that we're all on the same page when it comes to mentoring. Um, we're all for it. We all applaud the work. Uh, that our mentors do, and we know we need um, more funding from Raleigh. And if we have an opportunity to do stuff here locally in terms of funding, I certainly would vote for it. So thank you. Council Member, yeah. Council Member Freeman. I just want to follow up and just figure out how we do move it. So do you need a thumbs up? Do you want to have a vote? Like, how do you move forward on that? Yeah, I, well, I wanted to see if there was any other discussion first, and then, then we'll... That was, was it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Councilman did you? No, I, I just, I support this. I know that we have a lot more, um, we have a lot more flexibility to do more at the local level. So I'll support it, uh, move it to the action agenda, that's fine with me, but my focus will be what we can do locally. Hopefully the General Assembly will see our hunger for it. Councilman Freeman, sure. And I will add the comment. I think it's important that we do move it to action because it is going to be critical that in this time frame with all that's going on that we're advocating as a city to actually have funds available and to make that act a state act, the same way that the, the Juneteenth is still on the advocacy list for the state, but it's not um, implemented um, I mean, it's implemented federally, but not at the state level. And it's on the list as advocacy in that same vein of what you're talking about. But I feel like the 
youth mentoring is something, as um, Ms. Good, Mr. Good mentioned, that's nonpartisan, and we can definitely lift that up with our uh, delegation to make sure that it moves forward um, with a lot more, yeah, action. So, sure. thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And again, it, uh, it, it needs to be understood that this is not binding on our delegation. This is not an order to our delegation. This is a, an expression uh, of our will uh, and our desire as, as a council. And, um, you know, we hope it'll do better uh, this time. But certainly this, this is, it, it will be, yes, it will be sent to our, this is not being sent to the, le the legislature writ large. This is to our particular delegation that represents Durham. Um, and then they will um, do our bidding for us there. So with that, just thumbs up if we want to move it from, all right. Staff, if you would note that we'll, I, I believe that we'll take item, four items, uh, the number of items on our action uh, list from, I'm sorry, Chief, Chief Wallace, did you want to? You're correct. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Um, if the decision of the council is to move the support of the Youth Mentoring Services Act um, to the action or legislative agenda, that will um, increase our list by one, so thereby making it uh, five requests instead of four. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you much. All right. Councilman. Good afternoon, Ms. Wallace. Real quickly, when we do meet with the delegation, and I know we're meeting with them soon, will we be able to prioritize within that? Like what, 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 because it's a lot. Um, so I just want to have a better understanding. So typically they prioritize for us okay. based on uh, some of the comments that Mayor Pro Tem have mentioned based on what they believe they the, think they, okay. the trajectory of each of these requests are. And, and the legislative breakfast is a public meeting. Um, we are scheduled to have it on February the 20th at 9 a.m. in the committee room. The public um, is welcome. And in previous legislative meetings, the delegation has shared with us in those meetings what they're willing to advance and what they're not. So it's quite possible that we will hear then what they're willing to move forward. Thank you. Sure. Mayor Pro Tem, got it. Absolutely, Councilman Ryan. And I, I just want to also um, say that this Youth Mentoring Act was also something that was done in 2021, right? And so some of those same people that actually pushed those, this, this bill are still there. And so I'm hoping to get an audience so that they can hear this. Uh, so in terms of us prioritizing, okay, yes, they're going to prioritize it, but I just wanted to put in preference that they have already put this bill in and didn't pass, but they did put it in. And I felt that we need to put it in again because we still have kids dying. We still have things that we're not doing. And that's why I wanted to see it. So I thank my colleagues for allowing us to move this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, anyone else on this item? All right, then we will go to item 55, resolution in solidarity with Durham's LGBT, mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus community. Um, I'm pulling it, but Council Member uh, Johnson had uh, requested action on it. Did you want to make any further comments before I? Uh, no, I'm happy to just defer to my colleagues for comments or questions. Thank you. Colleagues, any, anyone else before I? All right, I pulled this item. Um, f firstly, this is absolutely without question something we should be forwarding, a resolution that this should come forth from this council. Um, I do, first, I want to say in terms of uh, just from an institutional um, history and, and integrity point of view. I don't, I don't think it's precedented, at least since I, I've been on council, where we've moved a resolution um, that was not tied to a deadline that had to do with money or, or something of that nature. They usually come from staff because of the speed of legislation going through a legislature. I, I don't know that that's something that, um, I mean, when HB2 was passed, we, our voice came after that, that legislation was passed as well. So I'm not sure about establishing precedent where because of the speed of legislation going through um, uh, Raleigh, that our resolution, you know, our voice, I don't think will be less morally powerful after it's passed or not. If we're not gonna, we can't veto it. We can't stop it from happening. And I think that it's important also that when we put the imprimatur of the city uh, the voice of the city behind something that it that we've had opportunity to, to massage it and make sure um, that the language is fully reflective of, of where we stand. I wanted to call first off in the resolution the, uh, the attention, um, the second whereas, uh, whereas members of the LGBT plus community currently experience the highest rate 
of hate-motivated violence among all mar marginalized communities in the U.S. Um, I don't know that that's true. I, I, I don't know that factually that that's correct. And I think that the, the, the power of these resolutions is, is the weight, the, the moral weight of the voice of the people of Durham. And I think it undermines that voice if we say things knowingly that are not factual. Um, an accident is one thing, a mistake is one thing, but you know, I looked at the FBI, and, and if, it's so, if there's a source, I mean, in other resolutions when we've made claims like that, we'll say according to such and such, or according to such and such. I think if this is the case, we need to source this, but the sources I've looked at, I looked at FBI numbers, they published 2021 at the end of 2022, They'll publish the 2022 numbers at the end of 2023. And by far, the, the, the largest amount of cases are, are, are with race. Now, the significant, there is a significant percentage for um, um, LGBTQ community. I think it was like, what I saw was like 19% or 20%. It was almost 69% that was race-based. So I guess my, I don't think this, this resolution is ready to move yet. Firstly, just on that point, and then I have one other uh, question because I, I think this should be tight. I think this, this should be, um, if it's gonna have the imprimatur of our city, um, you know, we, we should be able to, we, we, I don't think we do any favors to, our, to the community or to our allies um, if we don't take care to make sure that our moral voice is unimpeachable as much as possible. And the facticity and righteousness are not mutually exclusive. So my first question is, where did this number come from and, and how is it sourced? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. The numbers sourced from the FBI, um, which shows that the victimization rate for LGBTQ people, so the rate at which LGBTQ people experience hate crimes is the highest of any other group. The number of hate crimes that happen in the US, um, the number of hate crimes against black folks is the highest, but the victimization rate for black people is four victims per 100,000 population, and the victimization rate for LGBTQ people is 11.9. I'm happy to send you um, this data that was um, taken from from the FBI figures and and published uh, online. I, I looked at this. I think we should. I think we should uh, somehow source that um, because as it reads now, experienced the highest rate of hate motivated violence again among all marginalized communities. I, as that reads now, I think that's questionable in, in the way it's framed. Um, in, I'm sorry. I don't, did. What about it do you feel is questionable given, I mean, are you, do you doubt that, that, that what I just told you is true or do you think that, I don't understand. Well, I'm not gonna fall into that trap. Cle clearly, I don't, I don't doubt that uh, the level of violence against members of the LGBT community is, is high, but you, you use the term victimization rate, which is, yeah. and, and if, you, if, the, if it's turning on the term victimization rate, we should probably say that. It says, because, it says rate though. It, it, you use the word, but why are you using words that, let, let's use the words that you used in the resolution. I mean, if, if we're, and that's my point, if somebody reads it back to me, if we have to add a word or clarify it, then that type, then, then that says something to me. I mean, let's make it as tight as possible. As it reads now, I can see members of other communities, particularly uh, uh, the black community, taking issue with it as it's framed. So let's just be precise with the language. I don't understand what's not precise about the word rate. Given. Let me put it this way. You said victimization rate as if there's something different between that and what's said here. So why not put victimization rate in there? We could put victimization rate in there. I don't think that using the word rate is inaccurate, however. I use the word rate, highest rate, not highest number. So I don't understand your objection. I did not say that LGBTQ people experience the highest number of hate motivated attacks. I said we experience the highest rate. I don't think that framing is accurate either. And based upon my reading of the FBI uh, documents, uh, the FBI numbers that I saw, but if I think that what a, um, a, um, a path forward might be is why don't we source it? Why don't we put according to, as we've done, that's well-established precedent, uh, according to the American Heart Association, according to US Bureau of Labor and Statistics. I mean, that's not uncommon. Why don't we source that? in this, in this uh, resolution. So you want me to say according to the FBI? According to wherever you got it. Why is that, why is that controversial? I think it's unnecessary, that's all. Uh, I, 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 it, why would we wanna make a declaration of, of something that on its face 
could invite um, scrutiny, could invite, and I think that takes away from the main goal we have here, and that is to bring the moral weight and voice of our city in alignment and in conjunction and cooperation with our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ plus community. And if there's ways we can make this document tight to minimize any distractions, why wouldn't we want to do that? Why wouldn't we want to source a statement that on its face invites controversy? It's an accurate statement. And I take issue with the fact that you're questioning it, given that you very rarely question accurate statements and resolutions brought by other people in this council and about other issues. That's my issue. I knew you would. And I, I knew you but would I think it's about unnecessary. About it. Hold up, hold up. The mayor's going to have to jump back in, mm -hmm. and we will hear from a councilwoman who's at Hyman for a second. So I'm going to put my professor hat, and I was talking about essential. We always talk about what, excuse me, uh, evidence base, right? So I can understand the citing, but we could also use populations at risk. That is a population at risk, point blank. So I, I don't really understand the wordsmithing, but it is a population at risk. And I feel the way it's worded is talking about populations at risk. You literally use different words and that's there though. Why can't we, why can't we, why do we, have, why do we read something and then use different words and say that's what it's saying? If, if that's what you said is true, then why don't we just put that? Why, why can't we just be precise with language? But I, I don't want to go back and forth, but I, I just I want to say, too, that I, I think it's irrelevant to the evidence base and sourcing and stuff like that. We're talking about people. And so I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. I'm going to turn to um, Councilwoman Caballero for a couple of comments. Thank you. Um, uh, we are not on consensus. I, I just want to say I appreciate my colleague. I, I understand the urgency behind this resolution and we can wordsmith it and we can accept maybe some friendly amendments to language. I don't really care. What I do want is for folks in our community, like what is happening in this state right now and across this country targeting LGBTQ and trans people is terrifying. It is moving us to a fascist state and everybody needs to be aware. Black folks, Latino folks, immigrants, gay and trans folks, the time is done for this, quite frankly. It is a dangerous, dangerous time in our state. What is happening in the General Assembly for a parent, for any of us who have uh, LGBTQ plus friends, neighbors, loved ones, I, I, we can wordsmith this to death, but I really just need some resolution on this. This is, we talk about the fear that some of us have. There's a lot of fear for lots of reasons in this community and I need Durham to stand up. Do you have any comment, um, Councilwoman Freeman? And then we'll just take it to a, a vote. I think that's what um, Councilwoman uh, Johnson is asking. Is that what you're asking for today? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was just going to um, note that I completely understand um, the sense of urgency and a, a it is important that we do stand in solidarity, but I do think that Mayor Pro Tem is correct and that we do want to make sure that the language can't be challenged in a way that makes us look like we don't know what we're talking about. And so whenever there's um, pushback on a resolution like this, I, I feel like we should take it, just add, either add the source or change the language, but it should actually reflect what we're trying to say as much as possible, um, just acknowledging how our media and legislature tend to use our words against us. And so I, I, I don't know that that needs to take extra time. Um, and I'm not sure what the delay, like what, what Monday nights, you know, 10 days from now difference would be. So somebody has to explain that to me, what the rush is to suspend the rules and vote today, because that I am not certain on. That's all. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, colleagues. And I, I do want to, I, I want to be very clear about the theater uh, going on here. And th th this is theater. I have written a number of resolutions, all of which went through the mill. I wrote Durham's resolution on anti-Semitism, uh, uh, anti-Semitism, white supremacy, uh, and Islamophobia. Uh, and I went back and forth with colleagues, former colleagues on this council, back and forth. Um, I've written a number of resolutions in which we've had time to massage it and wordsmith it. So the notion that it's somehow different or exotic, that we're massaging uh, or wordsmithing a resolution is simply not true. Secondly, 
when we put the imprimatur of our city, the weight of our moral voice as a city behind something, why would we not want to make it as tight and precise as possible? Don't we want it to be unimpeachable? This isn't our seal, it's the city's seal. No one is saying that this resolution should not, do not fall for that trap. We need to speak on this issue. We need to. But I would, do not, do not fall into the trap that we need to speak so urgently that we can't do it with proficiency and efficiency. We can. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. There's no money tied to this. We have no veto power over what Raleigh does. Raleigh been doing this stuff all the time. We, we know what comes out. We know what they churn. So this isn't a surprise. HB2, we watched HB2 happen before we responded. It was long after. So yes, this is, this is a, and I, with due respect, I mean, folk can read. I mean, if, if you look at a document and you have to explain it, by using other words that's not in the document, that's a telltale sign. Be, and if the words that you're using aren't on the page, all I'm simply saying is, if you think those words are better, put those on the page or stick by the words you actually said. This language is questionable as it's currently put. It's questionable and I think it causes dissension amongst folk who should be arm in arm locked on this. There are plenty of ways we can capture the spirit of this document. There are plenty of ways that we can uh, uh, transmit uh, uh, the, the, the power of our moral voice as a city and still be correct and accurate. They're not mutually exclusive. And I'm not gonna fall into the trap that simply questioning uh, 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 the language used so we can, it can be most forceful and most effective is somehow not supporting it. Nobody's going for that. That's theater. All right, you're back, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We're going to turn to um, Councilman Williams, and then we're going to try to see if we can make some friendly amendments, and then we can vote up or down. I think we have to do a motion to suspend the rules in order for us to vote it up or down to move it forth. Okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll, ask, um, um, I'll have a couple of comments, and then I'll ask um, for Councilwoman Johnson to carry through her uh, motions. We're going to ask you to um, suspend the rules, um, and then we'll go from there. We can do this in decency and on order. All right. It's all right to disagree sometimes. Robust conversations. Let's go. Yep. All right. And for the record, everyone on this council supports our uh, support our LGBTQ community. This is what democracy looks like, and it's messy sometimes, and we just want to have it tight. So over here, whispering with Councilmember Johnson. And uh, I think if we were to just simply make one little wordsmith here where it says experience one of the highest rates, I think that, that solves it across the board for us. And um, she's perfectly fine with it. So we need to get this through. Damn. I'm not perfectly fine with it. Not perfectly fine. Thank you. <laughs> well, we can get there. We can get. But you there. would agree that we, that will be a, um, a, a a medium point to get to the vote to suspend the rules and go ahead and get to the vote if we make that friendly amendment. I have no further comment. All right. Okay. I know how my sister feels. I've had my stuff torn up all the time. I mean, you know, I've, I've submitted stuff that did not look the way it did when I first submitted it. I didn't take it personally. We, you know, that's just the way democracy works. Well, Let's move through the. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'll, gonna... I'll suggest that amendment if, yes. if the Let's, council is okay with. Let me change with our attorney to make sure first um, we need to suspend our moon, our rules to go ahead, and then you can make your friendly amendment. Just want to get some clarification on on how we move it on each one because we have we do have a friendly amendment to the document that we probably need to vote on as well. Sure, Madam Mayor. So, yes, if council's going to take action at a work session, you need to entertain a motion first to suspend the rules to take action. Once that motion is through, you can deal with the motion on the floor. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, I think we, we have a question from Councilwoman. Just a question regarding making changes to the resolution and then making it available to the public. How does that work? Like, I don't know that you can change it from what it is right now 
and then allow folks to review. Like, I think that's part of the process. That's why we do it this, the way we do it. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that part of this. Because I know that's been explained to me in the past that you can't just make the changes the day of and then that, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a little confused because that's not how it was explained previously. That's all. Thank you, council member. So as I would understand this process, once the rules have been suspended, someone would put forth a motion to adopt the resolution. If others want to offer friendly amendments during the consideration of that motion, then that could proceed. I'm, maybe I didn't understand your question because you look very confused. So if the document itself is changing, the resolution that we're approving is changing, there doesn't need to be a review, is what I'm saying. So a review from well, It whom? sounds like I was lied to before. That's what I'm getting at. I, I, That's what I'm lied getting Lied to by whom? I, I, I'm sorry, lied to... Can, can I? Madam Mayor, I don't have the ability to answer that question. Wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's hold up for one second. Okay, so Councilwoman Freeman, just explain your understanding of what was told to you about the rules. From, from what I'm hearing, this is the first time, and I want the general public to, get, to understand some of the intricacies. Okay, so this is the first time this has happened since I've been mayor. Councilwoman Johnson is act, has asked the council to suspend the rules and move this resolution as it was promulgated by her today and move move it as an move it and and, and um, rule on it right suspend rules we either vote it up or down and then from there it would move now according to what you're saying. Councilwoman Freeman, that is not your understanding of the process after it is changed, I believe is what I'm hearing you saying. If a resolution is changed, then there is a process that it has to go to the public for them to consider it. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Okay, so can you turn on your mic and elaborate what was explained to you? Because you're... May Okay. I'm in that one. Just keep it short, though, oh, yeah. Mark. And, and, and I'm sorry, Monique and Mia Protein, Dr. Heim, let's move it along. Yeah, I just wanted to say, can I just say that, like when I did my first one, the school safety, I think we voted on it, and then Mayor Protein and other people had corrections, and then they made those corrections, and then that was public. So I, that's what happened with the one I did. We actually did it before we voted, but you're right there were, yeah. And Madam Mayor, if I can just for, again, for the point of institutional integrity and, and what actually happened historically, this is unprecedented where a, a council member has asked us to move a resolution totally pinned by them without the courtesy of having their colleagues able to wordsmith it, time to digest it, and, and then to suggest that to, to, to lean on what has been established protocol and decorum for this body is somehow uh, uh, against the spirit of it. That is absolutely unprecedented. We, to, to suspend the rules to move a resolution that has nothing to do with money, that's, there's no timeline in terms of hiring, is unprecedented. It has not happened. So, it, it, you know, to, to, to the notion that, um, you know, wordsmithing is, is it's part of our process. What normally happens is when colleagues have issues, we have cordially said, okay, we'll take it back. We'll send you our words. We've even agreed to pass it on the next Monday meeting after we've adopted our friendly amendments and we've wordsmithed it. This is a resolution. It's not an ordinance. This is something that has resided with, with incredible cordiality and collegiality amongst us. It's something that we've done informally. It's something that's been very, it's never been this uh, controversial process because we've never asked us, any one of us have never asked this body to put the imprimatur of a city on something that they wrote exclusively without any review or consideration whatsoever. That's unprecedented. That's why we're having this conversation. What I would recommend is that we uh, uh, lean on regular order. There is no money involved. There is no deadline involved. Uh, Raleigh gonna do what Raleigh gonna do. They've been doing it. And our voice will be no less morally powerful when we pass this than 
uh, uh, if we pass it at our next Monday meeting or now. But if we're going to move forward in this way, then uh, to counsel to the spirit of Council Member Freeman's comments, then then we need to have time to wordsmith. That's why we we take it offline outside of these meetings, so we don't take up this much time in this context to do it collegially, uh, uh, cordially uh, amongst colleagues. That's how it's happened. This is new, some new stuff. <laughs> All right. Are there any further comments? Now, I, I do have to say one thing, you know, just I, I realize that precedent means a lot, but these are, as I've talked with our attorney, she's explained that those are our rules, and you also have the opportunity, as you hope you would, you know, to adjust or modify your rules or, or rely on precedent, but, but just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean that it can't. You know, that's just a life. It can, it can happen if it hasn't done before. And I like the spirit of the debate um, to see how we react in these circumstances. But I do think that it does really kind of call for a, a vote up or down, whether you want to do as they've asked or you don't. And we, we vote on that. Madam Mayor, and I'm, I'm gonna say that this might not, my memory may not be correct, right? So I'm just putting that in there. But I think that what happened at some point was we created this process to give the space um, when folks were introducing um, resolutions and it was just an opportunity. And so when I think that there's precedent and things, it, it is certainly within the last four years, I wouldn't be able to tell you because I think we, we talked about doing this along the way. And I don't remember which council member had put a resolution forward. And I think there was a lot of friendly amendments offered in that space, in that work session, and so then we had come up with this, you know, maybe we should do it this way, and it was to allow some space and some time for folks to wordsmith and whatnot. That is my recollection. I don't remember which amendment or which council member, or sorry, resolution or which council member, but I do remember we were kind of in this wordsmithing and taking a lot of time up, and so we kind of came up with this, somebody please ask ahead of a work session, and I think we decided a few, you know, which, Councilmember Johnson did, hey, I'd like to bring forward, and Councilmember Holsey Hyman did recently, hey, I'd like to bring this resolution forward. We give our thumbs up, the person introduces the language, and then we do pass it, you know, at one of the s subsequent meetings, but that is a process we kind of came to along the way, if that makes sense. And maybe my memory is not correct, and that's fine, but that's how I remember it happening. Um, to my council member, or to my colleague's points, Yes, in the last four years, I don't remember uh, us suspending the rules for this, but that's not because there was some major roadblock to it. It was just the process we created along the way. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, but I, 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 I really appreciate uh, the debate. I actually had another amendment as well. Uh, to, and this is why we, we, we have a work session to get to massage the language and, and, and give our input, which we have a right to do, to, if, if in our opinion they'll make it stronger. So I wanted to, in addition to, and I thank the, the, the council member for accepting the one of the highest rates, um, I, the, the plank where it says, whereas protests and demonstrations targeting drag shows and drag performers have increased dramatically over the last several years, with such protests being held in several locations in North Carolina. I'm wondering if the council member would be amenable to adding harassment and threats. And the reason why I say that is because the protest, the, the bills that have been introduced, the, the health care issues, those are actual hardcore act, governmental actions and policy issues. What I'm concerned about is somebody saying, and because they've done it before, is, oh, protests and demonstrations are, are protected activities under the Constitution. Y'all protested and demonstrated after George Floyd. And when I read this, um, you know, as, as abhorrent as some of the things that I hear people say, you know, I took an oath to a Constitution to protect their right to say it. As, as hateful as some of the things I've heard people say, their right to protest and demonstrate is enshrined in our culture. What they, where the line is crossed is when those protests and demonstrations turn into threats and harassment. And I'm wondering if we might want to, uh, in addition to what's protected behavior, as abhorrent as it is to us, 
with protests and demonstrations, if you'd be amenable to, to muscularize that language a bit, where we, where we also recognize that these aren't just constitutionally protected protests and demonstrations. These things cross the line where they're harassing people and physically threatening them, which has been the case. And I, I think the language should, should reflect that. Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem. At the time that we, uh, after we, the first motion I think will be to suspend the rules and then we'll vote on that. After that, the considerations will be to wordsmith with the two friendly amendments. And then at the end of that, I believe that we voted up or down as to whether it proceeds. Would that be correct? Or, or there's one other. Or we don't suspend the rules, we engage in regular order and we get together as colleagues collegially and wordsmith it and have it ready to pass at our next uh, council meeting in regular order. And that's, and that would be fine too. So do we want to vote on that part first that we keep it with regular order? Regular order. All right. Let us do that by a hand vote. Uh, um, all those in favor of keeping, basically letting it run through the process that it normally runs through. So we'll go to GBA. Thumbs up for those okay with that. Thumbs up for those who are not okay with that. All right, we have 5-2. All right, it will stay as it is and move to GBA next week. And please note those two amendments, I would ask that you all try to include those in a draft form and get those out to us so everybody have an opportunity. Absolutely. Review. All right, okay. Um, is that the end of all our pulled items? I think that was the last pulled item. I believe so, Madam Mayor. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, we'll head now into our um, presentations this afternoon, and we have some great ones. Up. I can't wait uh, for some of these presentations. So we're going to start first with item 45. That's going to be uh, the American Rescue Plan Act that's going to be led by Councilwoman Caballero. Item 46 is the Affordable Housing, housing Deep Dive. Um, Councilwoman Jose Hyman will lead that. Um, Councilman Williams will lead item 47, which is Go Durham. And after that, um, Councilwoman Johnson will be leading the presentations on single-use plastic bag fees, which is a supplemental item. All right, let's roll. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. I see Ms. Johnson and her awesome team. And we're ready whenever you are. Okay, good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, uh, City Council members. Uh, I am Bertha Johnson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. I am delighted to be here today uh, to provide you an update on American Rescue Plan uh, funding. I want to uh, take the opportunity to introduce my team. Uh, some are um, existing, uh, were existing city employees and some we hired into this process. I would say more than not, uh, most of them have not worked in local government before, so we've had a, had a fun time uh, getting up to speed on our local government bureaucracy and the way in which we uh, uh, follow through with our processes and procedures. And we also have some other folks in the room who you'll hear from uh, later in the presentation. So we have Robert Morales here, who is our senior uh, manager for grants. We have Victoria Samayor, our administrative coordinator, Scott Strain, um, who is our grants writer, and Shayla Light, a senior uh, grants account accountant. And one of the person I want to mention on our team is Carlos Hernandez in the uh, city attorney's office. And I would have to say Carlos spends a significant amount of his time working with us. And so we appreciate the city attorney's office for allowing him to spend so much time with our team. So just as a reminder, most of these uh, slides you have seen before. Um, the American Rescue Plan is an extraordinary federal uh, policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, it is also a historic opportunity for us um, to um, deal with some of our longstanding racial and economic inequalities and pandemic uh, exposed um, issues. Um, we um, at the city of Durham received 51.8 million, Durham County 62.4, and we'll talk later about how we can collaborate to leverage our resources. So again, uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, funding, um, it's, it's very flexible around you know, the categories um, that you can um, use, but we have um, also some final rules who are a little bit more, more stringent. But I'll talk about the, the top four here, Re revenue um, replacement, um, respond to far-reaching public health, uh, provide premium pay, which we did for men or our employees, water sewer, bar bland infrastructure. So when we found out that we were gonna receive this funding, we came to city council, some of you were not here at the time, and we proposed a process. And we started out with an internal process, which was, um, which was advised to us by the uh, award notice. So we went to our internal departments to look at what we needed as an organization. We also um, proposed to city council that we bring back uh, those ideas to city council for approval, which we did. And then we embarked upon a community engagement um, activities to go out to the community and ask the community what they believe we needed to use these funds for related to the COVID pandemic. So here was our initial timeline. Um, we wanted to have engagement, review, you know, allocation, and again, evaluation at the end of the process, which will happen not only with us, but also uh, from US Treasury and the federal government. I wanted to remind you all that this process, doing this process, we gathered a lot of information from our residents. Uh, we hosted community events. We developed a survey in partnership with Durham County, North Carolina Central University, and community-based organizations. Um, to increase public awareness, uh, we uh, advertised this opportunity in the newspaper as well as um, other magazines and broadcast. Uh, we placed and uh, we shared this information uh, during the PB process. We utilized uh, contacts gained through many of our other outreach opportunities like PB and uh, the comp plan. Um, we also sent out uh, email blasts to all residents and folks who had engaged with us in different uh, ramps in the city to make sure they were aware of this funding. More than 80 proposals were received during the deadline and were reviewed for eligibility. And uh, we'll talk later about the different projects that were uh, f initially funded. And we engaged uh, in partnership with Durham, Durham County again, North Carolina Central University and NIS and our Office of Equity and Inclusion. Um, North Carolina Central University actually had a specific host who worked with us. We had uh, Dr. Henry McCor, we had Dr. Harper as well as uh, Dr. Page, who actually served as the hosts um, who were bringing folks to the table to engage, and they helped us actually design the engagement process. Again, we had two community-wide events. Um, you may recall that we started out with those events, calling those events budget healing events. That was a term that came to us from, uh, at the time, Councilman Prelon, who um, had proposed we do budget uh, healing events, and once we received this funding, we thought, wow, now we can have funding to support the, the information that we get and the proposals we get from the community. So again, we received over 300 survey responses. The survey responses were not necessarily proposal, they were just ideas or people's comments about how we should use the money to support the community. But the final actually proposals, um, that number was 80. So during one of our events, we asked um, our, the participants to rank the following eligible uses in order they think should be prioritized. Um, as you can see here, number one, economic impacts, and the last one, water sewer infrastructure. And you all have seen these slides before, but I just wanted to remind everyone how we got to where we are and the decisions we made in the first round of funding. We then went back to those uh, residents, so whoever showed up, residents showed up at the second event, and we asked them, so what criteria do you think is most important in evaluating proposals? And as you can see here, the number one is racial equity. That actually, um, we paused for a minute, we worked with equity and inclusion to actually create an equity tool to use for that criterion. 
So we created a matrix, and these were the components, the criterion in that matrix. Eligibility, obviously, is first. That is based on U.S. Treasury eligibility, which is why you had eight proposals and you ended up with 34, because they had to be eligible based on those guidelines. And again, equity impact, that was where the equity tool um, determined whether the project was equity-based. Um, collaboration, we wanted to make sure that the uh, proposals actually collaborated with other organizations or the community. There may be other nonprofit organizations who were doing the same, um, who had the same mission, and we wanted them to do that collaboration. Obviously, we wanted it to align with our goals. We wanted the proposals to be community-driven. We asked them, did you go out into the community? How did you talk to the community about this? How do you know that this is what's needed in a community? So during COVID, obviously, a lot of times that was really surveys or that was information that they already had because they've already been working in a community. And then administration, we looked at um, how feasible was um, the proposal for us to administer in the organization as well as look at the data collection and all the other um, requirements of um, the funding. And the last uh, criterion was the qualified census tract, which is the HUD tract that was provi provided to us by U.S. Treasury. So how do we ensure the investments align with federal guidelines and community priorities? Um, we received lots of proposals, the 80, and we put those into these uh, groups here, health and wellness, uh, safe, stable housing, economic equity, and community resiliency. And as you may recall, we had at the beginning, we had one category, education, and we removed education based on feedback from council and we changed it to the community um, category. Just to remind you all, we had review committees um, made up of county employees, city employees, and residents. So at those events, we asked residents, if you're interested in participating in the review process, um, let us know and we will put you on a team based on your interest as well as your experience. Um, some, uh, we also had some volunteers who did not submit their project on time, sent us a proposal, it was past the deadline, so we invited them to participate on, the, on one of the committees in order to uh, be part, still be part of the process. So here is some of the data um, about our review committee participants. So in December, we gave you an, all an update um, and we shared with you our thoughts around, around um, how we should move forward in making decisions about which proposals we fund. Um, in uh, May of 2021, uh, Council uh, selected which proposals would be awarded at 70% of the original, original requested amounts. So we had, um, you all had the big spreadsheet, which you have as part of your agenda packet. You all looked at the spreadsheet. We had recommendations to, to uh, fund at 100%, the staff recommendation, at 100%, those with a score of 24 or, or above. Uh, City Council um, looked at the uh, spreadsheet, went away, had an opportunity to review those proposals, came back and thought all of those proposals were good proposals, and decided to fund them at 70%, maximum $1 million. So all proposals um, at 70% of the funding request, maximum $1 million. So, and that is really important, important to point out as we think about transformation, where some of the um, proposals came back to us and said, we propose, you know, five million or, or something really big, we're only gonna get 70% or max of one million. And so we talked about how we would be coming back to, to city council where you may focus on a smaller subset of those or one of the particular categories that we mentioned in the earlier slide. Um, city Council also deferred some proposals for uh, City Council, City County consideration based on the county allocation determination. At the time, Durham County had not gone through their process, so you all um, asked us to hold those and maybe revisit those after we had, after Durham County finished their process, and um, they actually started with us and they went through a different process where they selected categories up front and then looked at the organizations that can meet the requirements of, the, of those categories. So it wasn't really a, a match. Um, the funded project proposals work with staff to draft agreements. You've seen many of those outlining the terms, conditions, and reporting requirements. 
as I mentioned in the last update, this took quite a bit of time because by the time we came back to those proposals, we were under the final rules, and the final rules required us to collect more data. Um, it changed the eligibility, it changed the documents and the, and the qualification data that we had to collect as an organization to be in compliance. So it was basically um, like starting over again with the organizations. So it took a lot of patience uh, and a lot of back and forth to get those uh, scopes um, um, created and also have all of our, ag every agenda item that came to you all and the contracts, we actually sent those through the attorney's office. In some cases, they met with the school of government or other, you know, authorities to ensure that before they passed that on to you all, that they felt comfortable that those projects were eligible. And that was a good process. And I'll talk about some of the other things we did in the interim um, between when you uh, gave us that, that directive and we came back to you with those items. So again, the approved proposals, we had 17 in economic equity, nine in community resiliency, six in stable, uh, safe and stable housing, and two in health and wellness, 20.6 million. So what happened next? We hired a grants manager, uh, we, Robert. Uh, we organized our ARPA team, as you see here, in addition to Carlos, and, and Fred in, initially began this process with us because it required a lot more work to create the, the policy. Uh, we developed the policy because that is what was recommended as a best practice. Not all cities created a, a separate policy, but we agreed that that was a best practice, and we wanted to do that because we know people don't always stay in the same place, and we wanted to make sure over the years that there would be continuity in applying these funds and approving uh, our proposals. We developed templates with the attorney's office for the sub-recipient the sub agreement and sub-award agreements in a local agreements when we were working with the county and other uh, government agencies and memorandums of understanding for those proposals that were internal departments. Um, we had one-on-ones with every single organization multiple times, uh, probably not as efficient as we would have wanted the process to be, but we were learning as we were going along. And so sometimes we met with them, we went back, uh, we found out that we needed to get additional information, or they submitted documents, we sent them to the attorney's office, we went back. So if you hear that from organizations, it is absolutely true. There were times when we had to meet with them on multiple occasions, um, but, but you know it all worked out in the end. We had to, again, rework the scopes. Uh, what we realized, again, is when organizations submitted their proposals, they may have submitted that proposal on five million or one million or two million. And then we said, you're gonna get you know, one million or if they, you know, some other amount, we had to go back and say, now give us a scope based on that funding and give us metrics based on that funding. And so that was a, that required some time as organizations had to work through their programs and services to come back and give us that data. So we submitted agreements to departments for review again. If it was a related department, you know, we thank community development when they were projects related to housing or, you know, rental assistance or those proposals. We reached out to them and met with them for them to help us understand the proposals and make sure they were in alignment with what we were trying to accomplish in community development and not redundant. Uh, duplicative and in the work that they're doing, so we appreciate that. Um, so again, that was one example of the department that we met with to talk about the proposals where we had subject matter experts in the organization. And then we had to create a monitoring process. We needed to make sure that we could explain to the proposers, um, to the organizations, what the requirements would be around monitoring. And I would say we had some organizations, um, we had several, um, who to this day have not committed to the funding because they have not committed to the monitoring process because of capacity. Um, and that's a, that's a, major, um, a major issue that we're trying to work through. And even concerns around those who have, are accepting the funding, but it's yet to, it, it remains to be seen if they actually have the capacity to do the monitoring, which will require the staff to do more in terms of making sure that the city of Durham is safe in terms of, you know, spending the, the federal dollars. So um, here are the list of the agreements that have come through city council today. Um, these are, uh, a lot of the ones were in the, in the top, um, of the list because they had the highest score. They already had probably received large grants. They may have already received federal funding. They were the easiest organizations to create the scope and get the contracts through the process. So um, the discussion we really wanna have today is around uh, the remaining 
funding. And I wanted to remind you of what we've already done, what the process is like, as you think about, you know, how you want to use the remaining funding. Uh, 22.56 million. So I want to start out talking about um, potential joint city county affordable housing efforts. Um, again, we, wanted, we want to look at um, how we can leverage our resources and collaborate uh, with Durham County and anyone else who has you know, money to put to this to accomplish some of our, some of our goals. Um, as you recall, uh, in December, community development put out a request for proposals um, for um, affordable housing to, to supplement uh, financing for affordable housing developments utilizing low-income housing tax credits. Um, a total of nine projects were received. Uh, we actually funded four of the projects at 16.8 million, and we funded four because that was all the funding we had available uh, for the projects. What you see on your screen here are the remaining four projects. Um, so we, um, based on those projects coming forward and based on the feedback, we assume that those are projects we're still very much interested in um, actually um, implementing. And because Durham County is interested in contributing some of their ARPA funds to affordable housing, and this uh, amount is 20.9 million needed. And again, we want to commit to the dollar amount, not necessarily the exact amount for each project. As you all know, it's some time has passed and we'll need to get some updates. Um, but we want to um, make that commitment if we're going to make that uh, be so that we can go back to Durham County and say, you know, we're willing to commit 10 million if you all commit 10 million, which was the initial number that we shared with, uh, with Durham County. And um, again, Reginald Johnson is here today if you have questions about the projects. So the second uh, group of projects um, were the projects on the list that you all um, deferred for joint city county consideration. Again, the county's proce process changed to be different in categories versus looking at the specific organizations. As you may recall, we shared all of our proposals with Durham County and they participated in our engagement process, but they, their process changed in the end in terms of how they actually decided how, which organizations to fund. Um, on this list, I think there are two that Durham County is uh, planning to fund. That is YMCA and there's, um, I think it's the, it's the main, yes, it takes a village project. Those are two that they are committed to some type of funding. Now, when you look at the numbers here, obviously these numbers are the initial requests. They haven't been reduced as you did with the other organizations. So this is a second, um, I guess, option to revisit these projects. They came in um, with the initial batch of projects, their initial proposals. They came in within uh, the, the deadline of project proposals. We have not done anything else with these projects. So the third um, list of projects I have here are projects that came in um, after our deadline. Those projects uh, may have come through the opera email address, they may have come to the city manager, they may have come to um, all of you, most of you, I'm sure all of you have seen these projects in one form or another, but they've come through and the request was um, tied to opera funding. And so we put those on the list, um, uh, primarily to be transparent that they came through as a request of ARPA funding. Um, but some of them you've heard from these folks recently in council meetings, and some you may not have, but if you have questions about those, I'm happy to try to answer those questions. But I, I, I feel like you're probably familiar with all of these requests. And the last group of projects, um, we, as we uh, accepted projects that came from outside the organization after the deadline, we also have two projects that we're interested in that came from uh, internal departments. 
Um, General Services submitted a request for funding for, uh, for um, the Urban Forestry Division for Tree Planting Initiative. And this is really focused on the canopy, and it's around the data around reducing uh, energy costs in underserved neighborhoods by 50% by increasing the tree canopy. And uh, the folks from General Services are here also if you have questions about that, uh, that request. And then we have another one from General Services, Solarize the Triangle Initiative. And this is really focused on how do we actually um, help solarize homes for residents and, and uh, low to moderate income households to help reduce their ele electricity bills. And, um, and that would, I believe that is 16 to 20 eligible households will be addressed with this funding. And so again, I'm not very familiar with this program, but we have the folks in the room who are happy to answer any questions you might have. So again, what we, we're asking for is feedback on how to prioritize the remaining uh, funds. Um, we, the team will continue to, you know, one, once we hear back from you all, we'll work on establishing guidelines and processes um, based on these um, proposed um, ideas or requests, as well as any of those that you all have. Um, again, we still have to, once the decision is made, we still have to go back through the process. We have to refine the scope, determine that if the projects are eligible, and complete the required documentation, set up the monitoring, uh, meet with the organizations. And so the process does not change, uh, but we need to get guidance on how you all want to prioritize the, re the remaining funds. So here's our proposed timeline, which is where we are now, February to April, council select projects or, and initiatives. Um, and then we go through, again, our, our process, and then we negotiate contracts. Um, again, if those were, depends on what the proposals are, where those contracts get negotiated. Obviously, if those are affordable housing process, it would be the community development team and not our team. Um, and then council, the contracts will come back to you all again, as they always do for final decision making. So just as a reminder, we um, are always have our website up. We have our ARP um, at dermacy.gov uh, email for our, for our residents and folks to contact us. We have our website up. As we always do, we'll put this up on the website for residents to look at this uh, discussion so that they have questions or concerns, they can share that feedback with you or the staff as well. And so we try to make sure we keep that as updated as possible, which is why we send uh, folks to our webpage when they have questions about events or upcoming uh, council meetings uh, about this, this topic, which is why you might have some, a lot of interest today. So that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I am sure um, the manager is here as well to support me in that, because <laughs> we've had a lot of conversations about these proposals. It's, it's a tough decision. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to let, um, I have a couple of residents signed up to speak on the presentation, so I want to let them uh, go ahead and speak. The person I have right now is um, J.B. Buxton, and I don't know, I think he's here with us. Um, and then I wasn't sure, Madam Clerk, if there's anyone on Zoom that's signed up. There's one individual on Zoom, Pamela Andrews but she did not indicate which item number she would like to speak to. Okay, after we let Mr. Buxton speak, we'll ask if, which item. Thank you. Um, okay, that's fine. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state your uh, name? J.B. Buxton. Thank you. President you have, Tech. And you have uh, three minutes. Sir. 32 Beverly Drive. Although for the college, 1637 East Lawson. All uh, right, council members, I appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you. I want to make sure you know a couple of things about our affordable housing project. Uh, I first want to say we feel fortunate to be in a city and county that has made this one of its highest priorities. And we want to be part of that solution. And I say that on behalf of our board of trustees, our foundation board of directors, our faculty staff, and our students. We know this issue well at Durham Tech. We did a study a number of years ago with Temple University that included 700 of our students, and we found that 50% of our students had experienced some level of housing insecurity, 20% had experienced homelessness in the past year. Uh, no doubt the pandemic has accelerated some of those trends. We want to be part of the solution in improving the housing stock of affordable housing in Durham, and we have a proposed project. If you look at the four or five that are on there, the Mosaic Project is the Durham Tech Project. 
We have uh, Mosaic Nonprofit Housing, Affordable Housing Development Partner, as well as Bank of America Community Development Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Bank of America. That's our lender on the project that does uh, affordable housing and mixed income projects. We have about six and a half acres of developable land on South Briggs, a great transportation route, access to 147 across from North Carolina Career Center, about 0.9 walking distance from our main campus where we can build 124 units out of affordable housing that would be split between 30%, below 30% and below 60% AMI. We've also had some good conversations with DHA about opportunities to use Section 8 based housing vouchers to create even additional 30%. What I want you to know about this development is that we subjected it to a rigorous community engagement process. We hired Partnership for Southern Equity uh, to come in. They have experience doing this kind of work in communities and getting deep community engagement about what potential residents, community members live in the area want to see out of an affordable housing project. They came in, we did four different sessions, had great attendance, including uh, Councilwoman Freeman's mom at one point who joined one of our sessions to look at what we needed to do and actually revised our site plan based on community input and feedback, both in terms of the kind of amenities of the project as well as this site plan itself. And so we are excited about this project. With this gap funding, together with a 4% LIHTC funding, we would be ready to move. We believe we have about 25% of those 124 units that we could make available for our students based on their eligibility under LIHTC, and then about 75%, which would be available uh, to the community at large. So I just wanted you to know about this high priority project for Durham Tech. We wanna be part of this solution with you and the community, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, do we, do we know if, um, which item? I'm unable to tell. Um, we have to ask her directly in open session. Okay. Madam Clerk, has she ra raised her hand to speak? She's not raised her hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now see if any of my council colleagues have any questions or comments. Uh, Mayor? Okay. Councilmember Williams. <clears throat> sure, thank you. <clears throat> the um, Madam Deputy City uh, Manager Johnson, these long titles. Um, is there a timeline in which organizations that were identified to receive funding, is there a timeline in which they have to make a commitment? The, you mean the timeline for the U.S. Treasury, which is December 2024? That's, we haven't yeah, had you were funds. There were some that had not committed yet because of the monitoring or something? Oh, yes, those. So we have not, we're still working with those organizations. I think we have uh, one that our general services department is working with trying to find an alternative to help them with their uh, monitoring, and that's from the arts uh, grant. And then we have one that we think is going to withdraw totally. So there will be some additional funds if we cannot work those uh, proposals uh, out. Some may require, we may be able to find a fiscal sponsor for them to help with the financial reporting uh, burden. But we, we've not given up on those organizations yet, but awesome. we need to work with them, yes. And, and let me just say this, um, I've been listening in on the work you all are doing, and the amount of support that you all are providing folks is just impeccable. Uh, thank you for strengthening our community through these organizations by providing them that type, that level of support that they normally wouldn't have. You know, a lot of businesses went through that during the pandemic. So if you haven't heard, thank you. Uh, thank you to you all. Um, President Buxton, first nice color tie. and. Uh, Thank you for the work that you all are doing in solving many, helping to solve many of the, uh, the issues that we collaboratively face in our community. Uh, lastly, um, Ms. Johnson, so are we, are we beholden to the process now? Because uh, I know we identified, we identified the organizations, uh, but this was the previous council, identified the process where we were identify organizations in which we were fund. Now we have this next tranche of money. Are we 
just locked in con de continuing funding these organizations that were not funded the first time, or do we get to select no, a absolutely not. new process? Absolutely not. So the organizations that were deferred, um, you all deferred them, I think, in hopes of collaborating um, with the county, right. leveraging our resources with the county. You, um, it's up to the pleasure of the council whether you want to revisit those proposals um, at this point or you want to move forward with other of your other ideas or initiatives and the others that are listed in the presentation. It was, and I, I guess I could ask those of you who worked on the subcommittee, is that uh, what you were thinking um, in terms of deferring those for discussion at this point that you would make that decision at this point based on if we were able to, to uh, leverage some resources with the county? I, I, I think we, we just as a state, so I believe we said we would put the, refer these because they were more aligned with what the county was focusing on. Colleagues, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was nothing concrete, if I remember correctly. That's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Daniel, sorry. Thank you all for um, a, a great presentation, but more importantly, all the work that I know you all have put into making this happen. It required the, the hiring of additional folk. And um, knowing on the contract side, uh, what that looks like, um, there is an enormous amount of work that has to go in to individualize all those contracts. So to think that we come back today and you all have executed 34 um, contracts and are actually getting that money out the door is, is um, a momentous and a commendable feat. Um, that, that's, that's that's amazing work. And then the monitoring process, um, you know, that, that's also going to be um, a challenge um, for all who will have to do that because at the end of the day, if uh, our organizations are not successful in meeting the goals and objectives as outlined by the federal government, they will be looking to get that money back. And so, and once it is expended, um, if those organizations, for whatever reason, would not have that money back in the event that they are not able to comply uh, with those regulations, which is why I, I am thankful that those who are struggling with whether they can uh, maintain that kind of um, system to kind of be answerable to, that they are reconsidering that. Because it, is, it has serious implications when you talk about 22 million dollars out there that we'll have to monitor over um, some year's time, make sure that people are doing exactly what they can and are capable of doing, and if not, then the taxpayers of Durham City will be advancing those funds uh, back to the government. So I just want to, which is one of the reasons why, um, as I came into this process, I have to be honest, as, a, as an attorney and a former judge, I was really leery about doing all of those individual contracts because it's just fraught with, with the ability to fail and you not be able to catch that in a timely manner to recoup those funds. And so thinking about the fact that the city attorney's office was going to have to go through all of these contracts along with all of the other work that they are now doing, it caused me a little bit of angst because that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work on the attorneys. It's a lot of work on your staff, in addition to what you're always already doing. And I have people tell people a lot of times, you know, you have about 2,500 um, uh, people who work for the city of Durham in a city of 350,000. And most of the work that they do, you, we take for granted because your water's clean, your, your, your streets are minimally and doing better in that area. But there's a lot of work that these people do every day. So I was a little concerned when they said, wow, we're going to get 30 nonprofits, individual contracts that they have to monitor for two or three years. That's a lot of pressure. And I wanted the city of Durham to understand that, which gets to my second part. Keeping that in mind, I do think that we have a couple of issues that we have made as a council um, the forefront of our conversations, and that's affordable housing. When I got here, the city of Durham had already gone through an RFP process and they were able to fund four, seven, four of the seven, four of eight projects that they had deemed ready to go and the city could check off. They were only able to fund four. And as we looked at that list, 
I saw Durham Tech is trying to do something that will put us on the map as one of those programs, right? A community college that will have housing. Who knows anybody else that's doing that? Nobody. Then when you look at the other three housing, we have folk who at least one of those have already begun to develop, uh, and this will be part two, I think, on the East Gear Street residential. That's part two. That's part two, is Fannie Ridge, Ridge Villas. There's another group that's a local group in this that is um, some yeah. local yeah. LGB that is a minority and business-owned local um, organization. And at the end of that, after talking with the county, the county is willing to help share that burden. And so the city officials and the county officials have come up with a way that we could possibly give these folks $20 million, taking half of our ARPA funds from me. So for me, that is a great balance because then you're dealing with brick and mortar. You're addressing housing needs at the urgency of now, and we're going to build that in conjunction with the county. And we'll still leave our, we won't put a whole lot more pressure um, on our city and counties to kind of monitor the daily day activity of NOM that, that when you're doing the human services kinds of things, they won't have that press. So I'd like to, I, I'm going to push my uh, attention and, and, and what I can do to make sure that we fund those four housing um, efforts first. And then the other ones, um, there are some that I am partial to, but um, we can get into those details later because at least two of them, I think the, I, I need to go back and look at what those are. But my first initial reaction is, let's build some housing especially while we got the county ready to do that. And we also had an opportunity to, to kind of make history um, in terms of uh, supporting our community college, which is doing so well. We have the opportunity to, to um, help a female and minority-owned development right here in our hometown to be able to do something in that space. So, and there's one group that's already out there building. They're just looking for us to say, okay, you can do the second half. I, I think for me, that's a win on, all, on the housing. The, and we're down to 10 million and counting. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Freeman. And thank you, Councilmember Caballero. I just wanted to um, agree that I think moving these projects forward is a great idea. I see no downside to um, putting additional funding into these projects that are, are ready to go. Um, and I see no upside to waiting. So absolutely 100% support moving forward with this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Council Member Johnson covered it. I was going to say the exact same thing. Thank you. Um, did you have your hand raised? Okay, yeah. Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Holsey Hyman. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you, um, <clears throat> colleagues. Um, I'm going to associate myself with everything uh, the mayor said. I think she teed up perfectly um, the notion we, we should probably go big uh, with this next tranche for a number of reasons. Um, the mayor, I mean, nailed the bandwidth issues with monitoring and managing so many smaller, it, it feels weird saying a million dollars smaller, but y'all know what I mean, smaller projects when you've got a big chunk of money. Um, I think the funding, the uh, using 10 million to fund the affordable housing, the, the pre-existent ones that we probably would have done had we had the money funding it, I think, I think is, a, is a great idea and, and something we should seriously consider as a council. And I'll say with the rest of the tranche, I mean, I, you know, full disclosure, I've, I've, in my budget request, I'm asking for a significant down payment on, on the Marshall plan or Marshall type plan uh, for legacy neighborhoods um, in our city. Um, and, and this pitch is, I hope it provokes uh, my fellow council members to think about big transformative things with this money. Um, one of the cool things about going to, you know, events like National League of Cities and U.S. Conference of Mayors, I thank the mayor for allowing me to attend this last one. As you hear your other colleagues, they, they're doing some stuff with ARPA money we hadn't even thought about that we hadn't, you know, so it's good to get out and hear what people are doing and what, you know, things we thought we couldn't do, actually turns out you can do. So hearing some of the best practices from around the country. So I, I um, would just pitch beyond the 10 million for the, the housing um, projects that the mayor's already uh, talked about, 
thinking about something uh, big and transformative that forwards our values. I don't know when we'll see money like this again, uh, and you know, aside from our regular tax base. So I would, I'm pushing for something that's transformative um, and generational um, with the rest of it. So I'm just putting that out there now. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Caballero. Thank you. Councilmember Paul Simon. So I just want to say ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, basically, you know, with my academic hat, we have a lot of students who, uh, first of all, insecurity, uh, food insecurities, and also housing, which is a deterrent sometimes to retention. So um, definitely agree with the housing piece. Thank you, Durham Tech, for that innovative strategy. Um, and again, like Mayor Pro Tem, like, let's go big. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Williams. And then I think the manager also had something. Well, I didn't know we were at the point of throwing the ideas out, so I'll just uh, add mine. Um, you know, we, we don't talk about small businesses a lot on this council. Um, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of risk that goes into that. Um, I'm on this council for a reason, and I'm gonna speak on that. So I would hope that my colleagues would be amenable to um, supporting uh, a revolving loan fund uh, or replenishing uh, the lifeline that was provided when we were in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, there are still businesses trying their best to, uh, and I mean local small businesses, the criteria is already drafted, uh, that are trying to just stay afloat. And these are the folks that are providing the local jobs. Um, you know, these are the folks that we're trying to, you know, keep people employed and also the ones who generate, you know, you curate that character for Durham. So uh, we don't have to put a lot toward it, but I do hope we can consider that. Thank you, Manager Page. Thank you for an, um, an opportunity to say a few words. I would also like to uh, thank the, the, particularly the staff um, members, many of which are new to the organization that have been working on this since they hit, since they came in the, came in the front door. Uh, of, of, of the uh, of 101 City Hall Plaza. So I wanted, wanted to publicly thank them, as well as our city attorney and her assigning staff to this team almost on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to make sure Durham does it right. Uh, one of the things that was really um, important to us uh, time-wise, because you all rely on us to implement your policy, and that is what we come to work every day to do. And we're going to be having some conversations trying to uh, connect uh, some policy direction ideas together and, and make it work with the money. So today we wanted to, uh, we are very happy because if we can go ahead and allocate in terms of our working and our planning, $10 million toward these affordable housing projects, which were not eligible until the final rules of ARPA came out last year. So we didn't even know we were gonna be able to use this funding for, for that. But because these projects are shovel ready, it helps us know that we can be more successful for the Fed's timeline if we can match some of their, um, their policies, which can be really stringent with what we're doing here on the ground. So we're gonna take this conversation today as an allocation of $10 million toward affordable housing. Uh, because I do numbers and I do them all the time, that does leave another, um, you know, 10, 10, 12 million dollars plus uh, that the council still has for consideration for for investing as we have conversations going through our budget, our CIP, uh, our green and equitable infrastructure dollars, and making it work for Durham. And so I just wanted to uh, want to say that I don't know if the team has additional direction that you're looking for today, uh, but just wanted, wanted to say that as, as the manager. Thank you for that, city manager. I was gonna suggest that at the mayor pro tem made his comments that just remember as you think about your budget request that you submitted, looking at those that this would be an eligible funding source for. So you may want, as the manager said, think about you know allocating that as you go through that process. And then you don't, you have fewer dollars that are competing with the other departmental requests. Um, Council Member Freeman, the Mayor O'Neill. Thank you. I just had a question, and just clarity wise. I'm realizing that we're saying 10 million, but I know it's 10 million and change would really be half. So do we need to say 11? I just want to be clear. 
we do not need a specific number today. We just wanted a commitment to the projects and those will come back to you because they need to update the financials around those projects and so they will be coming back to you. And then just secondly, I do wanna make sure that this is gonna be at the 100%, not 70% level that we were talking about on the previous tranche. Yeah, so, so on the housing uh, projects, we are, you know, we, we know that those numbers have to, you know, that the financing sources have to match the project. So it, it would be um, further um, evaluated in terms of what that gap is. The city always comes in uh, at the end of, of the funding stack. Okay. And so we, 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 that's why we wanted to have the projects here. We wanted to reinforce that we had gone through an RFP process that these uh, housing developers had been in that RFP process already and competed and are continuing to look at creative ways to develop their projects. So it was, you know, it was important to us. It was about a year ago, I think it was February, was it February of 2022 when we were in this process. So we know we have some updates to do, but we're committed to all and we're working as collaboratively with the county uh, to uh, make sure there's enough m funding in place from ARPA on both sides uh, to deliver all of the projects. And I, I do, I, acknowledging that a dollar in February of 2022 is probably like 80 something cents from today. So just realizing like it may be more, I do wanna make sure that it's clearly stated we should support moving forward with the number that is necessary to match that number previously supplied. And then also, I did wanna double check, do we still have our revolving loan fund with community, I'm sorry, Carolina Small Business, because I didn't know it, was, it wasn't was there. No, I, I we, thought we had one. Yes, we, we do still have um, mm -hmm. the loan fund uh, from 2020. Uh, it is still approximately, uh, still approximately a million dollars. Uh, in that loan fund. Uh, you will recall last year we, we rebooted it. We changed and, and reduced some of the uh, requirements, changed some of the terminology, and we have made a few loans as a result of that. But um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. We, we, we need to uh, engage our businesses. We need to find out exactly what they need to be successful. But to, your res to respond to what you say, we do have approximately $1 million. So to that point, I do wanna note that there are a couple of things we can do. Um, I know that there are more funds available now for small businesses with the SB SSBCI dollars available. I mean, I'm at the Rural Center, I can't not say it, um, that there are so many dollars that are available and those matching funds that we can make available can go like four or five times further. And so if, even if we were to increase that 1 million to 2.5 million, it could actually do a lot to further the need or to cover the needs of our small businesses and businesses in general within the city. And so it would be good to hear some, uh, I guess, feedback from staff on whether or not that's something we should look at or not. But um, I, I do note that there's a lot of capital available right now and it'd be nice to maximize. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill. Thank you, Councilwoman Caballero. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we are all clear that, you know, we, we decided those monies, we were saying 10 million at this point, is that, but giving them the option of uh, increasing that amount based upon uh, inflation. Is that, can we get a thumbs up on all that? So we're, we're definitely looking to uh, fund those four projects. We're starting them with an initial figure of 10 million, but keeping in mind, it may go up because of inflation, but they will let us know what that is. But saying, go ahead. I just want a thumbs up for everybody. Yeah, we're good with, Mayor so that JB Neal. can, um, I'm sorry, President Buxton can go out of here with a smile on his face. <laughs> all right, here we go. Thank you all, thank great you. stuff. Uh, I am also, just in conclusion, I thank you all. That is just wonderful what you all are doing. Uh, I don't know that we could ever pay you all enough to do what you're about to undertake and what um, Attorney uh, uh, Kim's office has done. Uh, we look forward to this being transformational and I am gonna echo Mayor Pro Tem, uh, we need to go big with the remaining monies and make sure that we are not overtaxing you all and have some 
real stuff that we, we, we can put our hands on 10 and 20. Not saying that all things are, 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 are not, um, you know, we're just not gonna get this opportunity I, again, I don't think. So thank you, that would be my remarks. Thank you, really, really quickly, I had just one clarifying question around this. So yes to everything my colleagues have said, uh, I know the staff has been incredible uh, around this, so thank you. Um, I've heard great things about your team out in the community and folks who've been having to work with you all and just the technical assistance you're providing people. Um, it's a moment to be proud uh, of our city staff. Um, but I, we're 100% want to fund all four projects. I, I know some of that is based on also not just inflation, but on the county also committing. And so what happens if you know, we're saying 10 plus some change, but what happens if we aren't gonna get any county dollars? I just wanna know yes. where folks are on that. So th the, way we have, <laughs> the way we have to work in, in spaces that we've never been in like we are right now is we take the 10 right now and we go to the county to get the rest. And if those conditions change and or these numbers change, then we come back and we we're gonna be with you all a lot. The mayor has just talked about it earlier uh, in in um, in March, and so we're gonna be working on this every 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 single day. But we we have had great conversations with them. You know, if they're 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 committed, so we're gonna you know we're gonna take that we're gonna take them at their word for now, and then if that changes, we'll we'll be back. Thank you, and I just wanted to thank um, President Buxton for being here. Um, that's an amazing project as well, and um, yeah, but go, go big or go home, right? And then I'm passing on to the next person. I'm not sure who the next presentation. I think before we go to the next presentation, we'll take about a 10 minute break here, um, for human needs. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all so much, that's great stuff.
Georgia. The whole black man sitting out. Okay. Three thirds time. Okay. Well back to order and I have the pleasure of having uh, to lead the discussion on the affordable housing deep dive presentation on the Durham eviction diversion program so we're going to ask the legal aid of New North Carolina diversion eviction program presenters thank you can you hear me okay there we go gotta get a little closer uh, my name is Sarah D'Amato, and I am the project director of the Legal Aid of Durham's Eviction Diversion Program. Thank you, council people and Mayor um, Pro Tem and Madam Mayor for this invitation. Um, like a good lawyer, I will talk all day long about my case and my cause, and so um, I will try to to just share with you um, some of the basic information about our program. Our program, as y'all know, is funded by the city. And so consider this perhaps a state of the union report on our city of Durham eviction diversion program. And so I want to, before I get started, um, introduce uh, myself again. My name is Sarah D'Amato. I am, I've lived in the Triangle all my life. I grew up in Hillsborough, went to UNC for undergrad, went to Central for law school, so lived in Durham. I live in Pittsburgh now. Um, I've lived in Raleigh. So I, I while Durham, I don't live here. Um, I did live here. I do consider myself a native of sorts to the Triangle. So these issues of how housing affects us uh, do mean a lot to me. Um, we have also here um, Ashley Campbell, who is now the executive director of Legal Aid of North Carolina. Um, Peter Gilbert is in attendance. He was the attorney who spearheaded this program. Um, when it started, and then Leon Horn is a supervising attorney with us um, also in our program. So again, thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we do. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the history of our program, and then I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about what we're doing now uh, with your money and the taxpayers' money um, for our program. And then I want to talk a little bit about where I hope we go. And I've heard, Madam Mayor, you call for us to go big, and I am inspired by that. So I'm going to put our ask in for more money um, throughout this program. And I hope that you can see through our results that we are good stewards of the city's money and that we are doing good things for the residents of the city of Durham. Um, and then, of course, you know, if y'all have any questions, um, at the end, well, you know, I will do my best to, to answer those. The 
Derm eviction diversion program. There we go. Did this advance? No, that was backwards. <laughs> Let's put it the right way. There we go. Uh, so the Derm eviction diversion program began as a partnership with the Duke Civil Justice Clinic and Legal Aid of North Carolina in conjunction also with the Durham County Department of Social Services. And the primary goal of this program when it started was to avoid eviction judgments and to decrease the number of eviction filings. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in terms of what that looks like in practice, but that is the primary goal. Some of the ideas that go along with that are trying to make sure that people you know, it, they, if they stay in their house, um, ideally we would avoid a filing um, in the first place. So the program started in 2017. There were only a few attorneys. I hear all kinds of stories about how many cases they all had to handle, sort of like how our parents were like, I had to walk to the school two miles in the snow. Um, so when the project la launched, there were, there were not a lot of attorneys. There was not a lot of staff on that project, and they still handled a lot of cases. Back in 2017, 2018, eviction filings were a lot higher than they are now, even a lot higher than they were in 2019 or 2020 um, before the pandemic started. So the eviction diversion program that we have in place is modeled after uh, there was, in Michigan, there were some eviction diversion programs, and so Durham took those ideas and modeled those program, modeled this program after that. And one of the things I don't mention here, but I think it's important to know, is that other municipalities in North Carolina have modeled their programs after what we're doing here in Durham. So Raleigh is doing an eviction diversion program of sorts, Mecklenburg, um, excuse me, Mecklenburg, uh, Mecklenburg and then Greensboro are all doing eviction diversion programs that are in some way, shape or another modeled after what we're doing here in Durham. So a lot of times part of my job is hearing from other people across the state to say, hey, y'all have got this program, tell me about it. What's it look like? And that's because they see what we're doing, they see the impact that it has and they wanna do it too. So in that sense, Durham has been a real trailblazer in that regard, I believe. I will note that, and I've mentioned here that diversion, at this point it's really um, it's sort of a pipe dream. Uh, we try to, to hope that that's what we're gonna do. We would like to be able to totally prevent somebody from being filed on and being evicted, but unfortunately in this, in this environment, that's not happening as much as we would love for it to happen. Um, and that a lot of that is due to factors that are outside of our control, which I will address a little bit later um, down the road. And so unfortunately, so many people, if they get behind one month here in Durham, or if their landlord wants to sell their house, they are going to be filed on. There will be an eviction filing. Whether or not that case eventually gets resolved because the tenant pays the money or because the tenant moves out before the court date, that is left to be seen. But in most of those situations, somebody is going to get a court filing if they are still in possession when their landlord wants them to be gone. So we do our best, we try when we have the opportunity to get cases before there's a filing, we do our best to try to prevent that filing. But once there's a filing after that, our main strategy is to ideally keep them housed or to prevent there being an eviction judgment on their record moving forward. So that's where we were. Um, the initial funding came from $200,000 support from the city of Durham. There was a smaller grant and there were four attorneys and they committed to handling 420 cases per year. So that's kind of where we were going in 2019. And then let's take us to where we are right now. Right now, that uh, current funding that comes from the city, there was an initial $500,000 for the three years of 2020 through 2023. And then due to ARPA funding, we got that additional 1 million for the two years, so 2022 and 2023. And so 
right now, the current staffing, there's myself as the project, program director, there are two supervising attorneys. There are seven staff attorneys. We hired four in the spring of 2020, and then we hired four more in the summer of 2022. Those four additionals that came on in the summer of 2022 were as a result of the courthouse clinic ARPA funding project that, that the city graciously funded. We have five paralegals. One of those is a Spanish-speaking individual. I'm the only Spanish-speaking attorney on our staff at this point. Um, and then we do have a community resource coordinator. The community resource coordinator's role it was essential to the initial program. And what CAS does is to connect our folks with coordinated entry, with the Community Empowerment Fund, with DSS, um, with DHA. So he is really the liaison in our organization for connecting folks with the resources in our community and also for building those relationships with those partner agencies. So this is where we are right now. And again, the money that funds this courthouse clinic came from the city, from those ARPA funds. And so this is where I go big and I say, I want you to keep giving us that money, please. Um, I think that you can see that our results show that right now while we're bridging this gap in Durham between the folks who are facing eviction, while they're waiting for those projects that y'all approved to fund, while we're waiting for those to be present, we need something on the ground right now to keep people housed right now while we are waiting for these units to be built and this affordable housing to be available in our community. And so one of the ways that we do that is by providing what we call the courthouse clinic. We started this program, it was in full force at the end of, uh, let's say July, August of uh, last year. We have an attorney present in the courthouse on the third floor, two doors down for where the magistrate courtrooms are. And that attorney is there from nine in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon. And we also have a paralegal there as well. So in those days, that is the prime time for small claims cases in Durham. Right now we're averaging about I, the dockets each week for small claims court, which is where, and I'll go, maybe I should have gone into the process first, but we'll go into that a little bit later. But the, when somebody's filed on their first stage of the eviction process in court is in small claims court, and that's in front of a magistrate. And so those cases are all heard on the third floor in the courthouse. And right now, when those dockets are posted each week, we've got anywhere between 100 to 200 cases each week of evictions in Durham. So our clinic allows for people to, without having had any other ability to contact us or to um, go to any other organization, when they show up for court, they can meet with one of our attorneys or one of our staff in order to do intake. At that point, they are able to do, we're able to do on the spot intakes for most cases. And so if somebody is eligible for legal aid representation and time permitting based on how the schedules work on those cases, in some cases we are able to provide same day representation for those individuals. That representation might just look like, hey, can we get a continuance for another week? And then that gives us time to in a lot of cases, what it does is it gives us time to connect the tenant with resources in the community. Have you contacted DSS? Have you contacted Community Empowerment Fund? Have you, you know, thought about moving out? Those are the different things that we can do even with just a continuance of a week. And so we are able to do that same day representation in some cases. In some cases, we're not able to. Um, obviously, you know, as an attorney, we have to, we have to make sure that we um, are diligent in sussing out our claims and making sure that we are um, upholding our professional responsibilities as it relates to representation of our clients. Um, most of the people who come to the, the courthouse clinic have a pending case in court. The other people who come to the uh, courthouse often have just received a notice to vacate and they want legal advice. 
Um, if they're not eligible for our services, we do refer those individuals to the organizations in our community that we believe to do, um, depending on the situation, uh, either pro bono work or um, uh, referral sources for them to find a private attorney. In small claims, most tenants are not represented. In small claims, approximately, I think the statistics are about 90 to 95% of tenants do not have an attorney. And where that comes into play is really, really, in some cases it is as subtle as being able to get a continuance for two weeks because you're gonna be moving out. So if I can just get a continuance for a week and turn in the keys, then I can avoid this judgment. Or my tax refund, this is what we're hearing right now, my tax refund, I'm gonna get it on Friday. If I can get one more month, I mean one more week, or you know, we can, we can resolve this issue. So an attorney's presence allows for even something as, as basic as getting just another week of time. The other part about that too is that um, it allows us to, to uh, raise defenses, habitability claims, uh, things along those natures. But we need the time to be able to represent those folks and to develop their case. So that courthouse clinic, we have flyers um, up. They go out with the summonses uh, for the eviction filings in Durham. So when tenants do receive court papers, they receive a, a flyer that tells them that they can come to our, our clinic for additional advice. There's an email address that they can send their documents to, and that email goes to all of us on the team. And at, currently, we have at least one attorney in court each day, in addition to the, court, the attorney who's staffing the clinic. So that attorney is the one who's representing all of the cases for that day, and then you usually have two at this point. So we are at the courthouse every day for small claims. One of the other benefits that I've seen in going there is that we serve also sort of as a, an usher in, in, uh, in the hallways there in the courthouse. Um, a lot of times traffic court line starts all the way at the end of the third floor and it lines all the way up third floor, third floor, you know, all the way along. And people will see us there and they're like, where do I go? And they're not our clients, you know, but, and there's no other sign. So we are often directing people to, no, there's traffic court. Here, this is your courtroom here for your small claims case. Downstairs is where you're gonna file the appeal. So we have a very constant presence with um, on the third floor at, at this point. And then also the other thing is that everybody, um, if you have a small claims case uh, magistrate for eviction, then you, if the judgment's entered against you, you get 10 days in order to appeal that case. And it's a whole, what we call a de novo trial, which means you get to start all over again. And that's actually where we get as lawyers the opportunity to do the things like send out discovery requests where we ask the landlord, please show me your lease, please show me all the notices. That's where we get to prepare counterclaims. We get to do that more intensive legal work. The past few months, we are averaging about 80 cases per week in that district court week. That's once a month in Durham. And so we are there in that capacity as well. And then of course, if, if somebody's not represented by us, we can refer them down to the clinic and then they can get assistance at that point. We've also gotten to the point too where the clerks, um, if, if there is somebody who has a question or needs assistance with filing an appeal, the clerks will refer people back up to the clinic for our assistance. The judges have also often referred folks to the clinic as well because they know that they can, a person can go there and get information about the eviction process. So we, I believe that we have a very strong presence, a presence and I think that that is cre helping us create more relationships within the courthouse. Um, here's the little nuts and bolts about the summary ejectment process, the eviction process. Um, there's a lot of, you know, when somebody says I got evicted, 
So if you ask me what that means, I, I would interpret that as you went to court, there was a judgment against you for eviction, and then you had to move out. But some people refer to being evicted as if they've just received a notice to vacate. They've been told they need to get out. So that, you know, that, that is, that, that's not an incorrect statement at all. It's just how we interpret what it means to be evicted, right? So, um, but summary ejectment is the court process by which somebody is evicted. These trials in small claims, there's no right to discovery. So, you know, it's kind of loosey-goosey a lot of times. The trials, if there is a trial, it's only gonna last, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes. It's really quick. Corporations do not have to have an attorney. They also have a mechanism in our general statutes that allows them to, to sort of win even if their client is not there. As, uh, so that means that we have lots of tenants who show up, they show up, and their landlord's not even there to say, you know, hey, I gave this lease, I gave this notice. They don't have a person there to testify, and the attorney can't testify. And in those cases, the, there's still a judgment that's entered against them. Um, again, after that judgment is entered, then there's a 10-day period to appeal. The next part is what makes our jobs very difficult, is that after you appeal, in order to stay in your house while you are waiting to have your new trial, you have to pay that monthly rent directly to the court each month. So if you don't, then the sheriff can padlock you, change the locks. You may have had the best case. You may have all of the best defenses. And if you can't pay that monthly rent bond to the court, then your, landlock, your landlord can change the locks and put you out. That is huge right now in, in Durham and North Carolina especially for individuals who are actively seeking assistance through DSS, for example. They've got promissory notes from DSS that say, hey, we'll pay your arrears, but they're waiting on that check to come through, they're waiting for that assistance, and they can't pay that monthly rent right then, and so then they get locked out. That is not necessarily anything that we can change at this point because that's uh, dictated by statute. But that is one of the things that in the past where we've had rental assistance programs, rental assistance programs that worked really quickly helped alleviate that effect by providing financial assistance to folks at that first step so that they could at least stay in their house while they continue to, to uh, represent or defend their case. Um, again, now if you are in small claims and you lose and you don't appeal in those 10 days, then the landlord can get a writ of possession and lock you out. And so right now, also in Durham, um, and again, this is statutory as well, the, they must execute that writ within five days. And usually the tenant only gets two days notice before the padlocking. So what that means in theory and in practice is, in theory, they get two days notice. In practice, what happens is those notices get sent out to the tenants by the mail. And so in some cases, the tenant doesn't know that there was a writ until the sheriff is at the door changing the locks. After the writ is executed, then they've got about a week to go back at least once to go get the rest of your stuff. So. As I note here, this whole process from start to end, you could miss your February rent this month, have court next week, and then be locked out by the beginning of March. So when you take that and you combine it with the fact that rents are outrageous, they're increasing, the Rental application fees are $50, $75, $100 per person, and you have to have perfect credit and, you know, know how to plant daffodils in their garden and all kinds of other, you know, uh, interesting uh, requirements. 
the folks that we have that we represent in, with legal aid, they are struggling, struggling to find housing once they've been evicted, once they, the locks have been changed. So many folks are living in their car until they find a new place, or they're living with friends and family, or they're trying to get into the shelters. And this is one of the reasons right now why our shelters are full. Um, just a few kind of what's going on in terms of evictions right now. Non-payment of rent is the majority of the cases. In the cases where there is rental assistance available, these, some of these programs require a court filing in order for there to be expedited assistance. And so in those cases with our assistance and we're able to work with DSS and work with the landlord, in many of those cases, once that assistance comes through, then those folks are able to stay in their homes. So that, that piece of our work is, I think, really crucial when we have rental assistance funding is to be able to have another partner that provides that legal assistance so that the two can work together. So when there is rental assistance available, we can preserve the tendencies more often. Um, in another slide, I'll show you some of our outcomes. And it's very clear that when we had the Durham Rent Relief Program, our outcomes and our results at that time, we were preserving tenancies in 70 or so percent of those cases. Now that there's limited rental assistance right now, those numbers have dropped because if somebody's not able to pay their past due rent and their landlord wants them out, I can't preserve that tenancy unless the landlord um, agrees to some type of payment plan or agrees to, to accept that rental assistance. Um, and that goes, that goes to the other one where rental assistance is not available. So in some cases, this is, it's not available because um, you know, DSS is one of our, our primary partners on this and they have income uh, requirements. There's also varied requirements that have to do with how long ago you lost your income or whether or not your tenancy is a sustainable one. Um, and that's based on whether or not you have a job sometimes. So in some cases, that rental assistance is not available. And so a tenant is not going to be able to pay off any past due balance in order to uh, stay in their home. Another situation that we see is a lot of uh, landlords at this point are choosing not to accept uh, rental assistance. One of the main reasons we hear is that um, they, you know, if a tenant has had maybe a history in the past year or so, likely due to COVID probably, um, then, then landlords are concerned, as they say, with their ability to keep paying moving forward. However, what we also know is that every time a tenant is evicted, the rate, the base rent of that property goes up. And each eviction causes those rates to keep going up. So in some cases, landlords are seeing that, you know, their market is really heavy at this point for people looking for housing. People are gonna pay $1,800 a month for a one bedroom apartment in Durham. You know, I, this tenant is paying $1,500. It's better for me to, to just cut my losses and try to rent it out to somebody at a higher rate. So in those cases, there's, in most cases, most eviction cases, there's no, the landlord is not required to accept payment. And so in those cases, most of the time, those will eventually result in move outs, either because of an agreement or because the legal line has ended and they're at the end of it and then they get padlocked out. Um, so that's the non-payment cases. The other cases that we see some are the holdover cases. These were really big during COVID times because these were under the radar. Uh, they were not included specifically in the moratoriums that uh, put a lot of evictions on hold. Holdover is, is let's say I've got a tenant on a, you know, buy a house and there's a tenant there and they're on a month to month lease. Um, we've had clients who've been living at a place for 10, 15 years and their house 
The owner sells the house and then says, you've got seven days to be out. So in those cases, um, our defenses are, are usually fewer because, uh, you know, if the notice is adequate, there's not too much we can do in that situation. And in those cases, rental assistance doesn't matter as much. Um, what matters in those cases to preserve those tenancies is legal assistance because we are the ones who are going to bring up legal defenses and also try to maybe work with a, an owner of a, a new owner of a new house. So, um, and then breach of lease, these are not as common um, in, in private housing. These are more common in subsidized housing, but this is like your, your failure to report an income or failure to, you know, unauthorized occupants. We are seeing a rise in this unauthorized occupants part, and that is in part because people have a sister who was evicted, and so they want her to, they, you know, they're offering that they stay with them for a little while, and then if it's subsidized housing, there are limits as to how long a person can stay in a person's house and whether or not you have to report it. And so people are losing their subsidized housing right now because they are offering their homes to family members who were recently evicted. So um, these are the main things that we're seeing in eviction cases right now. And again, most of the ones that we're going to see are for non-payment of rent. I would say probably about 80 percent of them are non-payment of rent. Our current outcomes. So I, I do want to put in a plug. Um, I heard in the previous presentation about the monitoring that is required with this ARPA money. And I, I will say that uh, Keishma James is the person that we've been working with. and. Um, those monitoring meetings have always been very positive and very helpful. And we, have, we meet with her monthly and we provide reports to her monthly as to what we're doing with the city money on that. And so I do appreciate her guidance in, uh, in helping us with this program and monitoring us. Um, the current, so under the program, we have current goals. Our current goals right now are to preserve the tenancy in at least 50% of the cases and to avoid eviction judgments in at least 70% of cases and to open up um, 840 cases, but that was in part, we're closer to 1,000 is what our, our goals are at this point. That had to deal with because of the timing of the program and stuff and it being prorated. So I, th I think the next, the little statistics here that I have um, about our outcomes in December of 2022 and then May of 2022 also show the importance of rental assistance and also the importance of having legal assistance and rental assistance work together in the communities. And so in December, we preserved the tenancy 45% of the time. So that was below our, our goal when you looked at all of our cases. But if you just look at the cases where we go to court, we are preserving tenancies in 60% of those cases. We're avoiding judgments in 76% percent of those cases. And that either is because we win, and so a case is dismissed, or we negotiate a move out agreement and the landlord takes a dismissal in those cases. Now in December, we've had limited rental assistance. Pretty much the only rental assistance that we have available is through DSS. And so again, that, that is not as robust of a program as previous in the past few years, the ARPA money that's gone through. So if you look in May, May was when the Durham Rent Relief Program was still very vibrant. People could not apply for it anymore, but they were still receiving prospective rent and they were also getting arrears paid off. And you'll see in that, in that situation, we did, we were able to preserve the tenancy in 72% of those cases because folks got rental assistance and then their landlords dismissed the case um, or they didn't file at all. So that was, that was really critical at that point. The, it shows how that rental assistance helped keep people in their houses uh, during the pandemic and then also um, moving forward. Some of the things I've already mentioned in terms of 
what we're seeing as challenges at this point. Rental assistance for short-term income loss is very limited. Uh, DSS, of course, is, is over, uh, understaffed and overworked and, and highly, you know, they've, there's a high demand. And so even to get a short-term assistance from DSS, it can take weeks. Churches are an option, um, community empowerment fund now with some of the money that the city has recently funded them. Those are other options for short-term income loss. But a lot of times what we see right now, we're seeing people being evicted for one month rent. One month rent and those filings are coming, you know, two weeks after that missed payment. So there's not a lot of breathing room in that regard. We're also seeing, as I mentioned before, a high demand for rental units. So there's a lot of people here in Durham who want to rent in Durham and rents are going up. I think we, we compared to Durham, uh, I think Raleigh and Durham right now, North Carolina had the highest rent increase over the past uh, few years. We are also seeing there's not a lot of folks who are accepting these uh, Section 8 vouchers. So in many cases, we're able to preserve the voucher, but then we have quite a few reports of people who have been waiting and looking and looking and looking and looking for a landlord who will accept their voucher. Um, and if they wait too long, if it's been six months, DHA in many cases can terminate that voucher. So if, there's a, if they're not able to find a new place, then sometimes people are not only losing their housing, but they're also losing their voucher. Um, Again, high cost of finding housing. I, you know, I'm, I, it's, it's one of those things where I, you know, I don't know that in general, unless you've been out there looking for a place to rent, that people are aware of how much it costs just to get into a place. And so application fees are non-refundable. And a landlord can have you fill out an application. They can have a hundred other people on that list before you, and they don't have to tell you that you're not going to get that housing. So you pay fifty dollars for yourself, fifty dollars for your spouse, and you wait. Security deposits. Uh, we have also, you know, you have to show that you can afford three times the income. We have a recent situation where we realized that a teacher in Durham barely barely can show that they can afford an average rent in Durham, just barely. Um, previous eviction filings, again, one of the things that also is not as well known, every single filing against a tenant in North Carolina stays on their residential record. They could have been taken to court 15 times and won every single time, and when their next a landlord checks up their residential history report, they will see 15 eviction filings. In North Carolina, there's not a mechanism at this point to erase those from a person's residential history. So every filing in that sense matters. Uh, past due balances, and again, rental arrears, those are also things that somebody might move and they avoid that court judgment, but then now when they try to seek new housing, they check in on the previous landlord, previous landlord says, no, they owe $10,000, and then the new landlord's like, yeah, no, I'll pass. So <clears throat> those are some of the things that we are seeing. The other part is habitability. We do have, in some situations, people are um, staying in housing that is subpar, that is, you know, there are a lot of maintenance issues, plumbing issues, mold, we hear a lot of that, and they don't want to or can't move because they can't find another housing opportunity at that point. So, so that and that, the effect of that on a family, when you have kids who there's no water or there's heating bills right now because there's, you know, substandard heat in some units, you know, when a family is paying, you know, 800 to to $1,000 a month in, in electrical bills, well, that's gonna cut into the amount that you're able to pay for your rent. So those, that's uh, the main things that we're seeing right now as to why folks in Durham at this point are having a hard time finding housing and staying housed. 
Um, just to talk a little bit briefly about this, um, y'all are quite aware, again, I've already mentioned DSS quite a few times, but they do send us referrals. We refer to them. Um, it, that is a relationship. Um, of course, if we are able to, to refer people to them for rental assistance, then we are able to usually negotiate with the landlord to see if they'll accept that, res uh, that assistance and hold off on the eviction. Uh, Durham Housing Authority, you know, last year when the Durham Rent Relief Program kicked off, we did a day-long clinic there in order to help folks get um, uh, into the system for that assistance. We also have a good relationship with the general counsel at DHA so that that f helps us facilitate, you know, if there's an issue with finding, you know, a, a person's voucher or, you um, you know, anything. So we have a really good relationship in that regard, and we're planning an outreach event in, a, in another month or so where we'll do a housing clinic. Um, we're hoping to do it at uh, McDougald again, uh, but we might, we might take it over to Cornwallis Road. So um, that relationship is also very important for us. Housing for New Hope, um, again, we, we regularly work with them. Uh, Community Out Empowerment Fund, we had a meeting last week um, I saw that y'all have funded them and given them some money to help for some rental assistance through the ARPA funds. And so now we have also helped establish a referral network with them so that we can send people to them and they can send people to us. And then again, Alliance, a lot of times what we'll do with Alliance is working, um, especially in order to, if we need to do what we call a reasonable accommodation request, you know, somebody needs extra time to move because they're disabled. Yeah, so sometimes we'll be able to reach out and ask for that assistance. Um, we, we also do a lot of work with the city, I mean, the law schools, Duke Civil Justice Clinic um, and the interns, and then with Central, which um, on our team, and I know Madam Mayor is a Central alum, as am I, and as is a few of the other attorneys in our office, and I will say that that partnership, of course, is near and dear to me because, um, you know, if you talk to lawyers in, in Durham and in the Triangle, you know, it's the central grads who are in the courtrooms and doing this work. And so I like to think of our program as an incubator of sorts for central law students. Um, we work a lot of times in conjunction with the Civil Justice Clinic at Central because if there's an individual who uh, we're not able to represent, then we can we can send to them. So, um, yes, ma'am. Yes, just want to ask how much longer is your presentation? Oh, I'm I'm almost done. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here we go, right into the future. <laughs> um, the where we are. I mean, I, the I'll just. I'll go big or go home, right? And the idea of, again, the affordable housing initiatives that y'all mentioned, that those initiatives are going to impact evictions because if somebody has a house that they can go to, then that's gonna make it easier for them to avoid eviction um, and find uh, housing because they're gonna be able to find housing um, if their landlord wants to sell a house, for example. So that is really important um, as I think that as our programs work together, the fact that we can keep people housed until some of these and other initiatives that Durham has going on, until they really start to come to fruition. So it would be my ask again that it, um, when you look at our numbers, that you'll see that we've been good stewards of the city's money in this regard. We have done, I believe, a good job keeping folks housed in Durham to when we can, we work and network with the agencies that provide rental assistance and that's a, an important, uh, consideration and so it would be my hope that as y'all are considering this next round of ARPA money that you consider funding us at least at the same level that we have been funded at in order to to continue to bridge that gap in the affordable housing crisis in in Durham so um, and then the other things you can talk about later <laughs> Thank you for your detailed presentation. I'm going to ask for questions from my colleagues. I am going to acknowledge Council Member Williams first. Thank you. So beyond the idea that this entire system is set up for the actual tenant to fail, um, and those are my opinions for the record, um, I want to ask the hard question. Mm -hmm. 
what are your suggestions beyond a Band-Aid fix? And that could be anywhere from, you know, us having a lobbyist in Raleigh to what, what more can we do other than, you know, uh, just an additional week or the temporary support? Because this is, this, is, this is not sustainable, and we, we need something more sustainable, and we need to be addressing this right here. Absolutely, and that's a good question, and I will put a little asterisk beside it and say that because I'm employed with Legal Aid of North Carolina, we do have certain restrictions and uh, certain comments that we can make. And so I will say that so much of what, what we're experiencing right now is a result of the statutes that are in place. So, so many of the programs that we might want to implement, while there is still a statutory framework that requires, it's essentially five days notice for an eviction. So somebody can get the papers on their door today for court next week. Um, their continuances don't happen very often. So we're bound by what's in the general statutes as to how much time these cases take. You know, as I mentioned before, in terms of the writs of possession, the statute says that the sheriff shall serve it within five days. So there's little that we can do on the ground to change that. So that is, I think, one huge thing. The, the other part about it, which is one of those things that I, is, is not very concrete. I wish I could say concrete. But when we understand fully that this could happen to any of us at any time, I think it changes that perspective. And so we have to get to that point where we realize and understand that one, missing one month's rent could put you at risk. And that if you don't have those community resources and family resources and generational resources, if you don't have those available right now, you could be out on the street. So, so last comment for me, and I, I do know about that very well. Um, just to sum it all up, rents are, rents are rising. Mm -hmm. Homeownership is getting tougher. Uh, you have to have two to three times the amount of the rent as a security deposit. Um, am, am I accurate so far? Mm -hmm. And also you have to go through a clearance check. All right. So we're in trouble. Well, one of the other things that we've seen too in that same vein is that recently, well, in the past year or so, a lot of our Durham residents who were facing eviction, because the rents were going up, they decided, hey, I'll go out to Vance County. I'll go to Granville County. I'll find housing there. Our office in Durham, we also go to Vance, Gray, uh, Vance Granville, Person, Caswell, Franklin, Warren, and I always miss gotcha. another one. And, and, when, and now our, the clients who we're re representing out there, they can't find housing either. And so Durham's lack of affordable housing is expanding into the areas around us as well. Yeah, and, and I won't be ignorant to, this, these are part of the growing pains of a growing city, but I, I do think that in addition to facing this reality that we need to put some energy into how we can uh, create a community that is more uh, supportive and a sustainable, through a sustainable lens. And I, I'd like to uh, maybe speak with you guys at a later time about what that may look like uh, in your line of work. Absolutely. I think other cities recently have done, uh, for example, like Greensboro at this point has converted a parking lot into a, a safe parking area for folks who are living in their cars and that that lot is monitored by law enforcement and there's like a portage on. Um, other, other cities have offered um, lockers that have allowed people to store their belongings in them. So there's some, some things that can be done acutely, uh, but those are the Band-Aids, right? And so the idea is that we don't need to have people living in their cars. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I look forward to continuing. Absolutely. Member Williams, I'm going to acknowledge Council Member Javier, then Freeman, then the mayor. 
Thank you. Good to see you, Sarah. Um, I spent a fair amount of time last winter in uh, eviction court, and I, I did it so that I could see what the process was and to have a better understanding. Um, and I really want to thank your, you and your team and the folks at Central. When folks can't, so a lot of our undocumented folks can't be served by legal aid. And if you look at a lot of the folks who are getting evicted who were in subpar housing to begin with, but at least they had a roof over their head, it is our um, Latino neighbors. Um, many folks can't access the same, um, maybe not. <laughs> it's not good enough, but they can't even access it. They can't access it, the, the supports that are out there. And so I know that Central often represents those residents. They've been a lifeline for that community, and so I have a lot of uh, deep gratitude for them. I definitely think we have to figure out some form of rent assistance. I know that there's folks working on a, a proposal that, quite frankly, is, is way more than we can afford. But when I think about housing, I think we're going to have to do everything. I think we have to look at land use. I think we have to look at building more units. We have to have rent assistance. We have to have eviction diversion. And we have to have every piece. Um, uh, I've heard folks say we need a day shelter, mm -hmm. right? So that folks can go shower and have a PO box because many folks who are unsheltered, if you don't have an address, you can't even apply for a job. Um, I am in the odd situation of being both a tenant and a landlord. I rent and I rent my house out. And there are some things that folks can do. I did not ask for a credit report. Mm -hmm. I asked for one month's deposit. I understand I'm taking a risk on it, but it's what we need our neighbors to do. And folks who, ha who are smaller, uh, these, are the, do, these are the small things that one can do um, that do actually help folks out. You don't need to have three months of rent. It's a hard thing to do when you're thinking about, I don't know anyone who has $4,000 lying around. Right? We're very few folks who have $4,000 lying around. So I'm just putting it out there because I think there are small things that, that, that are beyond government, right, that folks can choose to do. And it's a risk. I understand that. I live it every month. But it's still something we decided to do because we had a house. We charge less than we need to for market rate housing, and it's something else we could choose to do. We're not using our property to completely be greedy and make a profit. We're doing it to hold on to an asset when we're ready to be back in it. And I hope that other folks in Durham also have that attitude. I understand it's counter to the system we are in, which actually you know, is a system of greed and exploitation. That is a conversation for another day. Um, but I just want to say thank you, and I hope that we continue to, to fund you all at the level that I've seen. It has been a tremendous support for uh, folks in Durham. It is absolutely necessary, and it's way cheaper to help keep folks in their, in their current housing than to build new housing, even though we also need to do that. But it is cheaper, and that's one of the reasons we did the eviction diversion is because we saw an opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to acknowledge Council Member Freeman, then our mayor, and then Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Caballero, for covering a lot of uh, what I would have said. And I, I, did, I did have a few questions in there, and I did want to say to Councilmember Williams, we should probably catch up, because I feel like the Tenants Bill of Rights is the best way to advocate forward, because if we don't get rights in place that actually allow a tenant to stand, like to stand in the courtroom and say, these are my rights, I don't think, I mean, it's, the system is set up way lopsided, and, and that's the best thing we can do. I, I, I did want to note uh, or ask, are you, copy, are you collecting copies of all of these lease agreements, and if, are they housed someplace that students could do research on them? Um, we collect, we have a lease bank, um, but most of that information is going to be specific to the individual client, and so... Um, and maybe it's a conversation to have yeah. with, a, with a research mm -hmm. institution so that, you know, no personal information, but Absolutely. to at least have the language that's being used and the transition, as Councilmember Capiero was mentioning, as folks move to the application fee and to mm -hmm. the, these are all things we could be working to combat if we know more about what's in that lease. Um, right. And then uh, I didn't know if you were collecting demo data. I didn't see any in your uh, report or your presentation and so just want to make sure you do state you know yeah. who you are serving because I feel like that's often missed absolutely um, the demographics are part of our monthly report that we send to the city and so I did as it uh, for 2022 in terms of our demographics for the year of the cases that we opened and I think we it was a total of about 
um, 850 cases or so. Um, of those, 63 identified as white, 626 identified as black or African American, and six as Native American, and some other race as 61. So an overwhelming, close to, what, 70%, of the individuals that we represent are identifying as black or African American. 626, that's? Yes, ma'am, mm -hmm. And I just wanna also know, are you collecting the demographic data maybe on landlords, whether it's a large corporation or um, a single you know, property owner or multiple property owner? I think that, that this will all be really good to kind of tie together what we've been saying, what we know kind of tangentially from a lot of stories in a way that actually gets us to the point where we can make the case that this is a problem for some in our legislature. Right, at this point right now, we could probably break that down for you. It's not something that we have been reporting on so far. I do know that other organizations, especially DataWorks um, based out of Durham, I do believe that they collect that data and, uh, specifically. And I, I, I do want to say that I appreciate the public education on evictions, and I want the public, the general public to know, as Councilmember Caballero mentioned, that legal aid cannot represent um, undocumented folks, but they do offer a, sub, like a substantial training to nonprofit organizations that mm -hmm. face people who are undocumented, mm -hmm. and it is very helpful to have that information at your fingertips, and so if you have not had the training, I want to encourage you to reach out to them and get the training so that your staff is well aware of the tenants, um, I won't say rights, but they're, I mean, there are they have advocates and they have ways to respond to questions that are asked of them. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanna make sure that that is uh, clearly stated. And I am adding, I, I'm just noting in my list, that, and my list keeps growing for this Tenants Bill of Rights, I will say, um, the erasing the rental eviction judgments um, figuring out something for the DSS arrears systems, because we know that that delay is going to live there. Uh, and then, <clears throat> I'm just making sure, uh, yeah, those are the three that I added. Yeah. And um, the lockers and the showers with the parking lot is something I am like specifically focused on. I feel like maybe I should be pulling you all in. I think I shared with council that the, there's a campus study right now for Urban Ministries mm -hmm. and my church, St. Phillips. Um, trying to figure out what it looks like, and I feel like this should be a part of that conversation uh, because it is, it's, uh, the way that things are in this state, uh, this one program is one that I will say that the program's goals don't actually address all the things that should be looked at. And even though you're not meeting those goals, it is very clear to me that it, without this type of program in place, there are so many more gaps and this is, this is a like semi-plug in a way that it's, it's so hard to even like think about what it would look like without you there because that over 800 people mm -hmm. without an advocate in that courtroom have no way to know exactly what it is they should do and shouldn't do. And I wanna say that the, the 1,200 others that they speak to about what you told them, I mean, it just kind of, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you're sharing information. Absolutely, that, and that raises a good point. Because of our presence now, you know, just like any program, you know, it takes a little while to build up the word in the community. And so now what we're seeing more often actually is a lot of our, almost all of our clients are coming from the courthouse clinic as opposed to through the general legal aid helpline. And another portion of that are clients who we represented maybe last year. And then they had us helping them at that point, and they still have my number in their, in their cell phone. And so then when they get a notice to vacate, they call me. And so I anticipate that as we continue to build that constant presence and that we've had this program, the amount of people that we will continue to serve will increase. We've also, we have a Facebook page where we will do some live videos on that. Legal Aid will do live self-help, uh, you know, how to represent yourself, what you need to know in eviction. We just published an eviction uh, guide that gives individuals resources. And that's, even if we're not able to represent somebody, those are resources that we're able to, to give to everybody. And there was one last thing I was thinking, as soon as you said the guide, I lost it. But um, 
there's there's a there's a piece of I'll come back to this. Come back to this. I'm going to acknowledge our mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and then Council Member Javier. Just very briefly, thank you so much being a central grad, law school grad. Uh, don't look, that's book too strong, it's that one. <laughs> uh, I just have a quick question, and I think Councilwoman uh, Freeman, I know if you're in the courthouse every day, you know the players. Are there particular landlords that you see more often than not? Are there repeaters? Uh, if you don't feel comfortable saying the, the, their names, but if you could give us an idea whether, it's, you know, a lot of people will take up a lot of space on a docket. Uh, I used to supervise those magistrates and used to uh, have some of those dockets in district court, court once it was appealed to that. And I will agree that, that law, the law in that area, in my opinion, is very skewed um, towards not helping poor people maintain housing. Um, so I saw that firsthand. But you always had some frequent flyers that you could count on. Are you still experiencing that? Yes. Um, we. There are some landlords who, um, in my opinion, use the summary ejectment process as a debt collection tool. And so they are more likely to consider that if they file and they, you know, somebody's now facing eviction, that that will be the impetus that that person needs in order to come up with the money to pay the rent to avoid the eviction. And then what happens in those particular cases is that the, because of the timing of the court, although that particular landlord, by the time you get to court, they could demand not just the rent that they miss, but then whatever month, like let's say we're at courts today and you miss January rent, the landlord could demand February rent as part of the, you know, to dismiss the case. But then sometimes they don't, and so then they'll dismiss the case, but now the tenant, because they sold everything they had, they, you know, borrowed every bit that they could, now they can't pay February rent. And so then now they get another filing for February, and they are in a cycle. And that cycle, once you get behind, and the landlord that you are leasing with, they have a right to do that. But at the same rate, it's, it's one of the ways that some tenants get trapped in a cycle because they're using everything that they can get in order to get out. And so um, that is, we do see certain landlords who do use that more regularly. And sometimes those are the, also the ones um, in their defense as ho housing providers that are actually more willing to work with us or work with a tenant in terms of coming up with that rental assistance. But at that point, sometimes the number of filings against that tenant, you know, it, it essentially means that that tenant's going to really struggle to find housing anywhere else at that point. Um, so we do have we do have that as you know we see that a lot, and then we also have um, not any specific landlord in general, but the the more you know common uh, apartment complexes. Um, that are held by, you know, LLCs. So you can't identify what the name of the company, the, uh, the apartment complex is by the name. Um, we see a lot of, of breach of lease cases from them. So those, and those are the cases where it's, they might be one month and then you're def there's no defense for a tenant at that point. Like, you know, saying, you know, but my mother died last week is not a defense for why you couldn't pay the rent. And then in a lot of those cases, the landlord does not have to accept the rent or they won't accept partial payments. And so those, are, I think, are the two, you know, the, the ones that might be smaller landlords, but, but use that as a way to collect the rent. And then the other ones that are just larger corporations that, that don't, they, they go by their lease more so than, in some cases, the relationships with folks on the ground. I'm going to acknowledge Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Javier. I'm also going to ask my colleagues to just let you know that we're coming on 5 o'clock and we have to also be in closed session. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much for the, the great work that you're doing. I, I want to totally affirm what you said about other cities asking about how Durham uh, is doing this. You know, it, it's one thing to, you know, do water and sewer and fix potholes to pick up garbage, but it's a different kind of swag to be able to talk about spending municipal money on eviction diversion, having an immigrant defense fund, you know, all the things that we have going on in Durham, is it, 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 
you know, it, it's, there aren't many moments you get to kind of brush your shoulders off in this kind of work, but this kind of work is, are, is one of those on rim. So I want to thank you for that. As long as I'm a council member and have a vote, I will always in perpetuity uh, support funding um, eviction diversion to answer your earlier query. Um, secondly, I, I do want to say also to speak, and this is it, speak to your um, point about the, the eviction filings. I don't know if you heard our discussion about our passing our legislative agenda, but one of the things we've asked our, our delegation to spend the, the precious political capital that they do have in Raleigh on is leaning in and drafting legislation to allow those filings. Uh, I, I had no idea that actually, you know, notwithstanding the disposition of the case, that the filing was still there and how uh, burdensome uh, that can be to folks. So just to, mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard, but we are asking our delegation, among other things, to, to lean in on that and pursue um, legislative uh, relief uh, when it comes to eviction filing. So, Thank you. yeah, we'll hope. Hopefully, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I've I've heard that there's some good movement in that regard, and it, it's such a, you know, it's a, it's one of those things that benefits the tenant. Ten years down the road, the landlord, it, it, yeah. there's no you know, reason why the landlord needs to keep that on the record or anything. So it's one of those things that has a really strong and direct impact on a tenant. It yeah. doesn't really affect anyone else. I'm asking our colleagues at the North Carolina League to uh, municipalities to lean in on that as well in their legislative uh, exploits. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council thank Member. You. Appreciate it. Council Member Javier. I'm good. I can. Okay. Council Member Johnson, and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Council Member Hyman. I just wanted to um, thank you for coming today and uh, your colleagues for being here and for um, doing this program and recognize just the incredible growth that it's had over the last few years. Um, and I hope that we can continue as a city to support the program and continue to expand it. You know, COVID, despite, you know, well, who knows if COVID will ever be over, but I think it highlighted a lot of the inequalities and challenges that people face in the system by, you know, making them worse for a while, but they, you know, it's still pretty intense out there for people trying to find affordable housing. Um, and there's no signs of the economic situation that we're faced with getting any better for low income people. Um, so we need to continue to invest in, and support these kinds of programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And my contact information, I believe, was at the end. So if anybody uh, wants to reach out, emails best, um, then feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, <clears throat> rich information. Uh, moving on, we have coming up next our uh, Go Durham presentation by Director Sean Egan. Have a way. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. My name is Sean Egan. I'm the Director of Transportation for the City of Durham. Uh, so I'll move right into the slide presentation. I know you've had a busy day, so I'll try to keep the presentation moving. Uh, so we have seen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic how transit can be critical for the essential workers who keep our community healthy and strong. We continue to provide personal protective equipment and fare-free service to aid in our community's recovery from the pandemic. Consistent with the city's carbon neutrality and renewable energy action plan, we are moving forward with the electrification of our fleet. And you can see here the benefits we are already seeing as well as major milestones ahead of us. Uh, we thank this council for approving the design contract prepared by our partners in general services for the Durham Station renovation project in December of 2022. We're excited to move forward with this transformative project for our transit hub. <coughs> our senior shuttle addresses the importance of access to fresh foods for residents in senior living communities who have limited transportation options. Uh, and you can see that we launched this in 2022 with five communities, uh, and we're continuing to grow and see significant interest in this program. Uh, the award-winning Go Durham, Durham comic is part of our effort to improve outreach and engagement in our community, particularly among families and youth. 
Uh, our comic book stories also emphasize what we know to be true, that bus operators are heroes. So by population, the city of Durham is the fourth largest city in North Carolina. But our transit system has the second most ridership in the state. This is the clearest demonstration of how much Durham residents count on transit for their daily transportation needs. It also indicates a strong appetite for more and better services we can provide thanks to support from the Durham County Transit Plan. The remainder of the presentation shows key performance indicators we have established for the Go Durham system. City of Durham, Go Triangle, and Go Durham operations staff meet monthly to review progress and identify opportunities to improve performance in these indicators. Safety is our top priority, so we start with these KPIs. We track incidents at our Durham Station Terminal, where we have nearly 12,000 daily boardings, as well as onboard incidents on all of our routes across the system. As shown here, rates are consistently below target, but we continue to develop training and customer engagement tools to reduce the frequency of safety incidents on our system. I addressed this body in the fall of 2021 when there had been a number of recent operator assault incidents. Improved training and coordination with law enforcement have helped to limit the number of assaults since we spoke then to one incident in April of 2022. However, as we know, one, one incident is too many. What you can also see here is that the majority of the onboard incidents are minor, general disturbances or rule violations, such as playing music without headphones. Note that in September of 2021, as we look at crashes that were preventable, we had zero preventable crashes. We are working to make that a regular feature rather than the exception that you see uh, in the report here. We've also created a million miler program to recognize bus operators who have in their careers logged one million consecutive miles without a single preventable crash. Due to the importance of transfers at Durham Station, the target for on-time arrivals at Durham Station is 99% or better. For all time points, our target is 90% or better. We have some work to do to get these numbers up and improve the timeliness of our service for our riders. The red line here shows scheduled hours and is used to measure the share of published 2020 service levels provided, taking into account that our announced service reductions due to staffing shortages. We are consistently around 100% of what we have, of the reduced levels that we have shared with our community. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, throughout much of 20, fiscal 22, we were at around 81% of our budgeted levels. So while we have the budget to be able to deliver more hours of service without the staff, without the bus operators to drive those routes at those frequencies, we're consistently uh, under delivering our service. Uh, we've made some significant improvements uh, since the end of fiscal year 22. We've been adding staff uh, and uh, we've, uh, currently at about 87% of our 2020 service levels uh, and with the restoration of 30 minute service on our Route 7 beginning on February 18th will bring us to 90% of our 2020 service levels. Uh, I had the pleasure earlier today to meet with some of the most recent graduates from our training program and thank them for making these service restorations possible. Uh, the reliability of our fleet is one of our standout performance areas. We've set an aggressive target of 20,000 miles between failures, and we consistently exceed this target. Keeping the fleet in a state of good repair is critical to avoid service disruptions that can impose a significant hardship on our riders. 
A major change we made in fiscal year 22 was to add a new executive position, Director of Customer Engagement at GoDurham. Since taking on this role, Sangeet Duda has brought a strong focus to addressing customer complaints timely and using customer feedback to improve training and procedures to provide a better customer experience. On the top, you see the passengers per revenue hour, uh, what I like to think of as a measure of how crowded our transit system is. This measure continues to climb. Most peer agencies, while we're approaching 30 uh, passengers per hour here, most of our peers have rates in the teens. And so we see additional service frequency and new crosstown routes funded by the Durham County Transit Plan as excellent opportunities to reduce crowding and improve the customer experience. Our focus today is on advancing major capital projects such as Durham Station and our better bus improvements while continuing recruitment and retention to restore 100% of 2020 service levels and prepare for expansion. Anyone in our community interested in joining the team can visit GoDurhamTransit.org slash careers and learn about our pay, which rises from $18.54 per hour to $19.86 per hour in the first six months and is paired with generous health care and retirement benefits for the whole family. We're also upgrading our fleet and planning for a new operations contract managed by the city that is designed to incentivize significant improvements in the KPIs presented to you today. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Director Egan. Questions, colleagues? Great. Um, just one comment, because I know we got to go. Uh, we, we do get a fair amount of, let me not say we, some of us are getting complaints from some drivers that they are getting, you know, um, so they're in some uncomfortable situations with, with passengers. But what concerns me is their response after that, and that's, you know, I tell my manager, but they tell me to, you know, shut up and take it or whatever, blah, blah, blah. There are two sides to every story. This is just something that recently came up to me, and um, how, how are we dealing with those matters? So I've heard similar feedback. Uh, it came up. We had a public meeting at Durham Station uh, a week ago yesterday um, and heard similar feedback from our operators who attended the meeting. Uh, we had our director of operations there who said, if you're not getting a satisfactory answer from your supervisor, then bring it to the director of operations, bring it up the chain. We need to hear about these issues. We need to make sure that these issues are getting addressed. So if you're not satisfied with how your supervisor is addressing this concern, escalate it, uh, because we want to hear about this. We need to address these issues, uh, and so make sure that your voice is heard. Thank you. All right, I'll pass on to Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Director Egan. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. Um, I believe I'm next doing item 53, our presentation on single-use plastic bags, and I've got a number of folks signed up to speak. I don't know if you all want to go in a certain order or what. Okay, so yeah, feel free to um, have folks come up as they would like. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Manager, City Council. Uh, thank you for having us here today. We know you've had a lot of important considerations, so we appreciate your time and attention. Um, this is an important matter uh, impacting Durham residents, businesses, and our environment. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Madeline Vital. I'm the Senior Program Officer and Grants Manager for Don't Waste Durham. Um, and I'll introduce our presenters today um, to talk about the 10 cent bag fee proposal. Um, Don't Waste Durham is a Durham-based nonprofit and we're based, uh, we established in 2017 and we're dedicated to creating solutions to prevent trash through education, advocacy, and innovation. And uh, as you may know, we've been advocating for the 10 cent bag fee uh, at restaurants, retailers, and grocery stores in Durham for several years. 
uh, and we'd love to see Durham join over 400 other cities across the country that have passed similar legislation. We've seen that this is a extremely effective tool in dramatically reducing single-use plastic bags, uh, litter, pollution in communities, especially at low-income and minority communities, um, while still allowing uh, for consumer choice. Um, this has the potential to save Durham businesses and city government significant money, and we see it as a win for the Durham economy, um, a win for Durham residents, and for our shared environment. Um, so as you may remember, um, in August 2019, we brought our proposal to the Environmental Affairs Board, uh, and they passed the proposed fee with a unanimous resolution. Uh, in October 2021, uh, the proposal was considered by the Joint City-County Committee, uh, and November 2021, city and county attorneys carefully considered our legal memo, and we established that the city has the authority to enact such a fee. Uh, since then, Don't Waste Durham and the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic teams have been meeting with city council members, uh, some of you here today. Um, we thank you for your time and feedback. Um, we've connected with city and county staff, attorneys, and commissioners, um, and have been incorporating their feedback. Um, we've also been gathering more data, including speaking and learning from other community leaders that have experience with similar legislation, both in North Carolina and in other states. And we've also been continuing our boomerang bag fee, Bull City Boomerang Bag program, uh, which provides uh, reusable cloth bags uh, for free in an equitable manner to shoppers who um, cannot afford to pay the fee or um, do not bring their own bag uh, when shopping. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to introduce the Duke Environmental Law and Policy team. Uh, they've put a, together a great presentation for you today and they're going to address how equity is built into our proposal uh, some of the negative impacts of single-use bags in Durham and beyond, and how our proposal supports the city's strategic plans and sustainability goals, um, as well as some ideas for implementation. This team has worked very hard in representing us and serving as legal and policy advisors, um, and they have a wealth of information, and they've compiled evidence-based support for this proposed ordinance, um, so our team includes uh, professor, professor Michelle Nolan, who's the uh, clinical law professor and co-director, um, Dr. Nancy Lauer, who's a lecturing fellow and staff scientist at the clinic, and clinic students Lily Hunter and Kat Taylor. Um, and you may also be receiving some comments from other local groups, such as uh, North Carolina Central students, the LRB Creek Watershed Association, and Keep Durham Beautiful. Uh, we look forward to your additional feedback and collaboration so we can ensure that this proposal becomes a successful and effective and equitable ordinance. So Thank I'll you turn so it much. over to the Duke team. Could you, sorry, could you repeat your name? Oh, sorry. Madeline Vital. Um, I don't have a card for you. Would you mind filling one out over at the clerk station when you get a chance? Thanks. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Maddie. Um, I do want to take a moment to let you know we will be giving you the abridged presentation today. Um, and so if you have any questions about the slides, if we're um, going over something, please be sure to bring it up uh, in questions. We'd love to support you. Um, and we also want to be very respectful of your time. Um, as Maddie mentioned, we are one of Duke's 11 law clinics that are working to advance equity and justice through Durham. You heard about the clinic that supports the um, housing eviction um, program to prevent that. And so our clinic is focused on environmental policy. And we're gonna to talk today about advancing Durham's goals, a plastics policy for Durham. And I'm gonna pass it over to Lily to talk about the importance of this work and its impact on our community. Right, so as Kat rightly said, um, basically the entire foundation of this entire proposal comes down to equity because while we are an environmental clinic, at the end of the day, what we wanna do is provide the most positive benefits to the community that we can. Um, and so this is something where we recognize that there have been concerns with how this ordinance would be implemented in an equitable way, but we hope to show through kind of um, kind of explanation of this ordinance that not only is that possible, but just by virtue of the ordinance existing, it seeks to ameliorate a lot of equity problems that exist 
just because of how plastic production negatively affects low income and communities of color specifically. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'm sorry to skip through so many of Lily's amazing slides. Please be sure to check out the statistics she's compiled on equity um, throughout the United States and also equity as it applies to Durham County. Um, we're going to dig into the proposed ordinance. As Maddie mentioned, it is a 10 cent fee on every non reusable bag. We developed this ordinance over the course of three years in collaboration with Don't Waste Durham and many other stakeholders. We analyzed policy, over six different policies in cities around the United States um, to learn what other cities were doing, what they were trying, what's out there. And we spent a lot of time deep in conversation with Durham businesses and Durham stakeholders like the Neighborhood Advisory Board to understand what concerns are relevant to the Durham context and how we can craft this ordinance to really fulfill that. We want to highlight some key recommendations that are proposed to be part of the ordinance. One is identifying and tracking metrics. Um, that will enable you and the Solid Waste Department to make sure this policy is adaptable. So if you notice that something needs to be changed, it'll be easy to tailor and you'll have the data necessary to do that. We also recommend utilizing the fee to support waste management program. The programs that could look like hiring someone to administer and collect the fee. Um, it could look like supporting waste um, reduction education efforts like the ones that your um, sustainability board has ongoing in primary schools. So you could supplement and expand that and providing reusable bags. As Lily mentioned, equity is a central concern that we've heard you all prioritize throughout this process. And there are three key components of the ordinance and its implementation that can ensure it's equitable for residents. One, um, the most important one I'd like to highlight is creating exceptions for low wealth individuals. So having an exception for people who are on SNAP, WIC, or receiving Medicaid, um, where this 10 cent fee would impose a significant burden um, when household budgets are already stretched. Another would be um, outreach and education, making sure it's culturally uh, sensitive and accessible so these populations are aware that they have exemptions, they know how to ask for them, and residents um, require less education for that and providing support for boomerang bags. Yeah, so that leads me into the next section, which is about business outreach, which again, we have noticed has been kind of a question surrounding this ordinance throughout the inception of the proposal. Um, one thing that we do want to note is the clinic has conducted outreach in the past years since this ordinance kind of began. Um, and uh, what we've found is that 80% of businesses that were given this questionnaire either had a positive or neutral reaction towards the ordinance, which kind of goes to show that it may not be such a large change for people as could be thought of um, without speaking with them. Um, we've done research also into other locations that have put into place similar ordinances, and those have also ended up being quite positive um, to the extent where people have been surprised that it works out nicely. And something else that we kind of wanted to get into with this is that depending on what our future research shows with the with our communications with businesses and what it kind of seems like their reaction would be into different aspects of this ordinance, it's important to note that you do retain a lot of flexibility in how you'd like this ordinance to play out. So it's kind of a way to make sure that you feel like you have options in terms of making sure business owners are still happy and that the community is still happy, but it gives you that flexibility and agency in doing so. Thank you, Lily. Um, and we're continuing that ongoing uh, research and outreach. We have heard from Councilmember Williams that you'd really like a better understanding of what implementation looks like for businesses. Um, we're in the process of reaching out to businesses in other cities with a similar ordinance right now, um, but we haven't been able to contact very many just yet. And so we're very excited to supply you with more information as soon as we have a robust um, sample for that. We wanted to really close this presentation by thanking you all for leading the way. And considering this ordinance, you're one of the many cities in North Carolina and throughout the South that is leading the way on plastics reduction policy. Just to highlight a few that are also in North Carolina, there's Asheville, which has passed, don't, I want to get this very correct. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in 2020, their council voted for a one-year outreach and education program um, to talk with their residents about implementing a ban on plastic bags and a fee on paper bags. Um, their plan is after the close of that year um, to vote again on whether to fully implement the ordinance. We see that Boone, North Carolina is cra crafting a similar ordinance to the one that Asheville is developing and has a voluntary business incentive program. Wilmington, likewise, has a voluntary business incentive program 
um, and has passed a resolution stating the importance of plastics reduction. And we are also, my apologies, in conversation with residents in Raleigh and Charlotte who are at the start of this process really looking at policy options and figuring out what will be the best fit for them. And so we're very grateful to have the opportunity to support you all and Don't Waste Durham in leading the way. Um, and we're excited to answer any questions you may have. I would like to invite Dr. Nancy Lauer and Michelle Nolan to join us at the podium so we can make sure all of your questions are answered um, with the full context. Thank you all for your time and your efforts. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple more cards from uh, Vine Nguyen and I think Jordan Bethea as well as Crystal Dreisbach who signed up to speak online. Are any of those folks interested in speaking at this time? So good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill and honorable members of the council. My name is V. Nguyen and I am a graduate student at, in the Department of Environmental Earth and Geospatial Sciences at North Carolina Central University. It is an honor and a privilege to speak to you all today. I am here to also to provide some suggestions regarding the plastic bag fee. I support on having a plastic bag fee in Durham for it encourages people to use reusable bags and be less dependent on plastic bags. This will lessen the amount of plastics in the environment. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2020, 13.9% of the population lived in Durham are in Durham live in poverty. While some may feel that this fee will hurt underprivileged members even more, I encourage everyone to see that this fee is a part of a larger movement. To ensure that this fee does not burden those members, I have some suggestions on making these um, Excuse me, to ensure that this fee does not burden those members, I have some ideas on making instructions for making reusable bags accessible to all. There are internet videos that show users how to make reusable bags out of old clothes and fabrics. In addition to these videos, having a step-by-step -step guide with photos will allow users to create their own bags at home. These videos and guides can be housed under the Connect and Engage tab on the city, in the City of Durham website. Also, public libraries can also distribute arts and craft bags to family with the basic materials needed to make reusable bags and a copy of the step-by-step -step guide. Durham can also host community members or community events that allow members to learn, to learn how to make their own bags and or pick up donated reusable bags. The final way to make reusable bags accessible involves education. In the fifth grade, I learned how to sew a pillow in art class. Young students can do the same in elementary and middle school, which will teach them the valuable skill of sewing and making reusable bags at home. At NCCU, students must complete 120 community service hours to graduate. Some K through 12 students need community service hours for certain clubs or honor society. I believe that schools can host events where students can make reusable bags in exchange for community service hours. This plastic bag fee is a big step in environmental preservation. It forces consumers to rely less on plastic bags and more on reusable bags, which will lessen the amount of plastic bags that ultimately ends up in landfills and waterways. In addition, the profits generated from this fee will be given back to the communities through donations. To ensure that everyone is equally affected by this fee, the City of Durham can host events or make instructions on making reusable bags accessible for everyone. Also encouraging schools to participate in outreach programs that make reusable bags will allow more bags to be donated to local businesses and distribute to community members who need them the most. Thank you for your time and let's Thank come together to, reuse, to reduce plastic bags in Durham. Thank you. Um, is Jordan Bethea present? Okay. Um, great. So that can, and the online speaker is also not here. Um, thank you, Madam Clerk, for checking on that. Uh, questions or comments from members of the council? <coughs> um, mayor Pro Tem and then the mayor. Thank you. Um, so thank you for this presentation. Excited about the implications. Um, environmentally that'll have a quick comment and then a, a maybe one or two quick questions. Um, first off, just from a, a cultural competency point of view, I, I've had a number of constituents talking to me about this and I've talked with colleagues from around the country about this type of ordinance. Um, for many black folk, these ain't single use bags. Um, it, it, a lot of black folks home, they got a whole bunch of these bags and they'll put one on the knob either of the pantry and that'll be like your recycling bag or your trash bag. I had one lady say, I don't ever, I've never bought garbage bags because I, those are my garbage bags and my lunch bags as well. So, so 
for a lot of folk, they're not single use. They, they repurpose them every day. Um, I, I do want to ask about the, the um, and I appreciate the focus on equity, but the, the practical application if we were to pass this ordinance. Um, I, I'm excited about the possible exemption, exemptions for SNAP, uh, WIC, and Medicaid, but operationally, would these folk identify, how would they identify themselves? If they're, a lot of these folk do their, their big shopping trip at one time, when money hits their EBT card, they'll go and get all their groceries at one time. But other trips that may not be their main grocery trip, are they gonna be required to show certification that they're on SNAP or WIC every, how would that work? So it's, this, this is kind of, this differs depending on the city. Um, different cities have implemented ordinances in ways where some don't require any certification at all. They take you at face value. Um, so if you say that you qualify, then you qualify. So it's kind of up to Durham in terms of how you'd like to make that implementation. Okay, that, that's helpful. And there, there are some, some low wealth individuals who are priced out of um, assistance, but they're still, you know, they still struggle. They're, they're, not, they're not middle income folk. Um, would, would SNAP, WIC, and Medicaid be the only threshold kind of metrics for, or do you know how the city is handling low wealth folk who aren't necessarily receiving assistance? Hmm. Um, I think I can take a stab at answering this unless, um, so that is something that is, again, this is a, an area to highlight where you all can decide um, what you feel would be the best opportunity. I would like to highlight, you can also address that through supporting boomerang bags. And so beefing up that program so low wealth individuals have access to reusable bags free of charge. Um, we know um, we've done some research into other cities and they have chosen to supply reusable bags specifically to uh, members of the population who um, either get the exemptions or might be lower wealth in order to alleviate that. And so making it possible so people um, don't even really need to rely on the plastic bags anymore. Um, but that is something that we can add to our research questions as we continue to explore further implementation. And I appreciate your highlighting that. No, thank you much. I appreciate y'all being here. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Tim. Our mayor's next. And then Councilmember Caballero. Thank you all for being here. I always like to see young, bright, legal minds in this area. You are both a law student, I think. Are you not one? I'm a law student. Law student instructor. Uh, Master of Environmental Management student okay. who really likes law. So, <laughs> so I, I, I am all for um, trying to figure out what we do in, in the, when we reuse plastic bottles, just all of it. But I just have a question on the equity issue because most people who can afford, you know, they're going to pay the dime. They're going to pay the dime um, who can afford it. And um, so how, how do you, how is that equitable? How do you define equity? Because it's going to be your poor people who will think twice before they spend that dime. But most people, will, it will just, for a lot of people, it, it's just a dime. Mm. So how do you balance that? How are you all, how am I to rationalize that when I go, and it's, it's like Mayor Pro Tem said, I, I have a lot of plastic bags. I have that same scenario right at home. They're sitting right in my trash cans. I do use them as my trash bags along the lunch. I did it today. Um, so they are not single use hmm. by, no, by no means in my household. Um, but I do recognize that, you know, I, I too have a certain amount of privilege. And so if you say you're going to, and I go to the grocery store and I have, I, I can't, I don't want to tote 20, 20 cloth bags. So my option will be, if I know I'm going to go in there and buy, you know, 10 bags of groceries, I don't know if I'm going to worry about the 10 cents per bag versus me having to tote 10 bags around in my car. Hmm. But that's an option I have because of the income. Not from the city, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> Not from that <laughs> that I looked at today. But anywho, so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you don't even want to tell me what that chick looked like as I was sitting here looking at it. Okay, but anywho, anywho you know, so how, how do you make that equitable? Because for some of us, you know, I, you, you pay the dime, and it's the poor people who, who will then not, it won't be equitable for them. So t talk me through that. 
Sure. So I think that this is somewhere, again, where there's flexibility in how the implementation of the ordinance ends up going through. And so you can end up making those decisions about what's the threshold you want for, like, who are the people who will end up being who, the ones to pay for it. To kind of go back into the equity, I think this is something where, and we, we sped through this aspect of the presentation, but the issue is that a lot of these inequities exist already. So these same communities who are, who are the poorest communities are also communities who are living near fracking infrastructure, refinery infrastructure that's causing a lot of air pollution, other health crises for the most part. So it's kind of something where this starts not just from the bags itself, but just the entire plastic bag mm -hmm. production. And so I think what this ordinance seeks to achieve on some level is it's kind of a shift in what that consumption is going to look like. And so that's how you kind of ameliorate the problem is from the beginning and creating less bags ends up mm -hmm. helping with that also. Um, if I may jump in, I'd also love to reference this question to Dr. Lauer um, and Professor Nolan, because they were there and doing a lot of that initial research about how this fee does generate an incentive for behavior change. Um, and so while it may be small, it does have an impact. Would either of you like to, to comment on that? Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Lily and Kat for presenting this uh, for our clinic and for Don't Waste Durham. Um, so in terms of equity, as Lily said, you know, this, the way we view this is that it's a problem from cradle to grave. And the assessments that we've done throughout the city show that um, low wealth communities are most burdened by litter. Uh, they're the ones who are most exposed to um, the uh, problems associated with disposal of plastics, you know, the Sampson County community that receives all of Dur Durham's waste. Um, and what we're also seeing in terms of the litter cleanups that we've been doing in association with other community groups is that upward of 40% of the litter that we're collecting are, um, is composed of uh, plastic film from the degradation of these bags. And so, you know, in that regard, this is a problem in equity in how we distribute uh, different burdens uh, throughout our community from, you know, cradle to grave in the plastic production and disposal process. In terms of the fee itself, what we are hoping for is that people will, um, that the, the 10 cent fee sends a signal to someone that this isn't something that is free, that is um, unburdening to the community, but that, you know, it, it has a cost associated with it. And so what we're trying to do is suggest a policy that reflects that cost to society um, so that uh, people are more mindful of the decisions that they make in accepting one of these disposable bags. And I should say, just as an editorial comment, um, single use is how it's designed, not necessarily I use them too for many things, including picking up after my dog. Um, so we understand that it, they have multiple uses. Um, it's just that they're designed as disposable and single use bags in any event. Um, so people who um, are not able to afford the fee would be able to just say, I qualify for an exemption. And the specific exemptions we've taken are modeled off of uh, um, policies that are implemented in other parts of the, of the country. Um, but that could be expanded to think about people who are receiving some form of housing assistance, for example. And by not requiring somebody to uh, show proof, you know, show their Medicaid card, show their SNAP uh, or their EBT card, um, that would preserve uh, a measure of dignity. They would still have to say, I qualify for an exemption. And as part of the education and outreach um, that we would do with businesses, we would uh, instruct people not to ask for proof, but just to take somebody's word on it. And so that way, if there were people who, um, you know, for whom the, the, the policy would still be a burden, um, they didn't qualify for whatever reason because of documentation status or, or um, you know, they're, they're just over the income levels, they would still be able to uh, take, um, avail themselves of that exemption um, for the bags that they need. I hope that addresses your, your concerns. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Caballero and then Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. I know you all have been working on this ordinance for quite some time. I remember when you came to Environmental Affairs Board several years ago now. Um, and I just want to say that uh, however we implement it or whatever conversation we have, I do hope we move forward as a council 
Um, I find it interesting, in Chile, they have banned all plastic bags and straws. There was no, they, they don't care what wealth you are. There are plenty of countries all over the world that are infinitely less affluent than the United States um, and communities that their, their low wealth individuals are at a level that are way lower than we really think about in the United States. So I think that there are ways to do this um, and that, that isn't too burdensome. It's been done in many, many places. I think if we think about littering, uh, forest fires, <laughs> we have lots of um, really great um, cultural advocacy, advocacy campaigns that we can think of that we grew up around. Um, and I think that if, if we move forward, and I hope we do, that we can think about how do we create um, something that is like very Durham specific or contextual so that we can work towards, so we're not just, oh, one day we're gonna put in this fee. And there wasn't a large campaign of, of education advocacy. I think the city does a really good job if we look at how we have used water over time. Uh, even though our population has increased, our water consumption hasn't, and it's because of a lot of the messaging that the city's done and a lot of the policies that the city's implemented, and so we have um, excelled at that. So I think we have pretty good track record on how to do this, and I think it's necessary, and we're all gonna have to make these kinds of decisions if we want a world that's very different, um, especially when I think about uh, plastic use, and I'm certainly guilty of, of, you know, I have a bag with a bag and another bag of plastic, and I use it for all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> um, but I also have been using cloth bags for a long time, so I think there is a lot of um, opportunity. Um, I know that in schools where they have switched to kids teaching them how to compost, so they could compost their, yeah, there was absolutely a lot of training, but if they could get kindergartners to compost all their stuff, I think we can get some residents to start thinking differently about their plastic use. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, uh, Council Member Johnson. Um, Professor, I just want to uh, respectfully say we, we know they're not designed for, for si single use. Part of the genius uh, of our people um, has been having, we call them coping skills, having in the jazz tradition, having to use something for multiple purposes. Um, pliers aren't meant to turn the TV and hangers aren't meant to be antenna uh, for TV as well, but, but it happens sometimes. I do also want to say um, from a cultural uh, competency point of view, because I, I want to be careful about conflations. The lo historically, the location of industrial level um, fracking or whatever um, um, entities placed in minority communities or poor communities was not predicated upon the buying habits of poor people. Those were systemic decisions, oftentimes to keep them out of the neighborhoods of the other folk who were using plastic bags uh, regularly. So I, I just want to make sure that that when we talk about the benefits of this, that you know, folk from McDougal Terrace, because they're paying 10 cents, you know, for, for a plastic bag, that that somehow is going to, you know, um, manifest itself in, in better decisions from powerful people far removed from their context where they place these type of facilities. Um, you know, we're talking about here as a council, everyday folk who are complaining about the price of eggs. Uh, and now I have to pay, you know, extra for the bag to put them in. Um, so I, I just want to just be very careful about how we frame um, issues when we talk about equity and, and, and culture as well. So thank you, Councilmember Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Councilmember Hyman's our next speaker. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much. I know you have been working on this on a long time, even prior to me being on the City Council, and then I had the opportunity to meet with you. I also just want to piggyback on what Mayor Pro Tem said, even with the structure of you saying that someone would have to identify that they basically are eligible. We still have to be specific, you know, kind of, I guess, look at that too, because that is a level of someone having to disclose. Um, and so, you know, I, I remember, you know, being a little kid, we used to have the food stamps in the, in, the, in the packages, right? And then it went to swiping. And so everybody doesn't really know what you're paying when, when you're swiping, because you could be swiping with a MasterCard. So I just want us to be conscious of that too, because even though we're saying they, they still would have to self-identify, that still is a level of self-identifying, you know, what their, I guess, income level is. So I would just be a little conscious when you're kind of working on how you're gonna do that. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Other questions or comments? Council Member Williams. Yep, thank you. So I have, uh, let me start off by saying I've been working on this as well with a few folks and talking with you all. And I will 
you know, uh, this is no surprise. I do think that this should move forward, but I do think we're a little premature before it being an actual ordinance. Um, one, I think there needs to be more outreach because it's really easy to say, um, we're just, we're gonna add a 10 cents. And 10 cents is just a dime, it's really small. I think for me, it's more the psychology of it. Also, another point is, um, and colleagues, I'm just give, speaking out the points that I've made to them already. Um, the other side of it is, you know, I think that we will have more impact which with the robust education campaign rather than a coerced uh, fee. Um, when the pandemic was here and we had to police, and, and we can talk about this theoretically, I'm speaking from a practitioner point of view, um, in my restaurant, trying to police people wearing masks when they came in was hell. <laughs> it was a lot. You know, now policing, who's gonna pay 10 cents or not, asking my staff to decipher whether, hey, are you on Snap or not, you know, or, you know, <laughs> or wanting someone to be in an uncomfortable situation to identify themselves. Um, I, I just think that there are still a lot of practical things that need to be worked out, and I can appreciate the outreach to other cities, and Crystal and I was just texting earlier, and she's gonna get me some of that feedback. Um, but also just the, the feedback here, you know, with the small businesses here in Durham, the other thing is, uh, I do think there's a way forward, but I pushed a little harder. You know, I would even support, you know, public art, you know, showing people how much litter we actually send to Sampson County. Put it right in Center City. Let's see the big ball of trash that we're sending out there. But people need to see this. Right now, this is a matter of Food Line versus Trader Joe's. You know, it's like you have folks that, oh, Whole Foods, you know, it's like, there is a demographic that has this as a practicing culture, and then there are some that, you know, look, give me my plastic bag. I need plastic rather than paper because I have to walk home, you know. Uh, so I can appreciate the sensitivity to equity, but I think the biggest issue here is uh, more so just, you know, how do we practically make this happen? And when you speak to some of the businesses locally, you may go upon a restaurant called Zoilies, where we do not offer you straws anymore. You have to request it. You know, you're going to drink your water. In a, if you're in-house, you're going to drink an in-house glass, not a plastic cup. You know, and I think those are some of the small things that we, do, we can do locally. Um, but I do ultimately believe this, this is something that the federal government needs to get involved in as well. Because I, I can tell you, 1,000 plastic to-go bags cost $17 at Sam's Club. Mm -hmm. When I buy a bushel of 100 paper bags, it's gonna cost me about $150. Mm -hmm. So that is a, that's a supply issue. That, that, those are organizations. Right now we're looking at enforcing, you know, this 10 cents fee on a use of single use bag. But Sam's Club get to still sell the plastic bags. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it's, it's like healthy food costs more. Mm -hmm. So who's gonna be at that, you know, that sacrifice? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I think need to still be hashed out. As I said before, I will be your biggest champion and I will continue to work with you all on this. I do think it's premature for it to be an actual ordinance. Let's work those kinks out. Let's bolster up the education campaign and bring it forth. If I, if I may respond, that's okay, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, please respond. I, I think you highlighted a lot of really valuable points. Everyone who just spoke, um, and certainly a lot of really important and valuable considerations for the education campaign. Um, something we weren't able to go into is one of our key recommendations is that there is this education campaign that's comprehensive, clear, accessible, and that it goes on for a while before this is implemented. Um, in terms of uh, the federal government ultimately moving on it, as an, envir like an environmental student, I'm like, yes, please, that's like what we dream about. Um, and I think in the case of this ordinance, cities and counties and states moving forward on this is one way of building that momentum towards eventually getting the federal government to go, okay, cool, we can do this and we won't receive as much pushback as we want um, or as we would expect. Um, and then in terms of the, the outreach or other policies um, having an impact, we, when we were doing our policy analysis, we did find that you can do voluntary campaigns, you know, that are encouraging people to change their behavior, 
And those are actually less effective than a fee because you don't have that concrete cost um, of, you know, it's not just weighing kind of my moral values, how close is this issue to me? Um, you're really weighing the, okay, like I know there's an immediate cost and I know that I can avoid it. Um, and so even though someone may be very privileged and be able to afford those bags, and that's important to account for, um, they, they may decide, you know, but I don't have to pay an extra amount. Why would I pay an extra amount for a bag when I could bring my own or I could not use a bag or I don't really need one in my house right now? Um, and so those are some, some of the reasons why these um, fees have been effective in communities um, in changing the behavior of members of the population on a broad spectrum. Um, and not just the behaviors of people who are in those lower wealth communities who will be um, inherently more affected by that. Yep. Uh, so what, I, what I'll say is I am going to, um, I'll support a robust education campaign with a resolution before we move to an ordinance. Mm. That's, that's me personally. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Pabiero, and I've got some thoughts about myself on the stack. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, I would support an education campaign with an ordinance so that we have a clear timeline. So 12 months, 18 months, whatever we decide, but I do actually feel, I mean, the, 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 we, we tax things that we don't want in our society for a reason sometimes, right? And so I, I, I understand that that's often not popular, but I do actually think that if we want, we have to change our behaviors. When I think about environmental issues, it's both collective and the individual. It is a combination of both to see a different future. And so part of it is going to be, you know, I'll be happy to be the dork who goes to the, you know, does a video and is like, don't forget your bag, you know, uh, I'll do it in Spanish and English. Um, and I did it when I had to wear a mask too, Spanish and English. Um, and uh, so um, I, I do hope that we, I know this, con this conversation may continue on council, but I do actually feel like we, we need to rise to the occasion of where we are in this moment. Um, and this moment, you know, we're in crisis. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, I've got a couple thoughts on how we can move this forward. I think it would be great to get some analysis of the proposal from our staff and from our city attorney um, with regard to the, um, some of the implementation questions and legal questions, if y'all would be, if we could send that along and um, have staff take a look at it before before we move it forward. And I also think it would be great to have a subcommittee of council, again, continue to work on some of the questions that have been brought up um, around equity and around implementation. Um, so if there are colleagues who would be interested in doing that, um, council member Hyman says she would be interested in being on a subcommittee, anyone else? I'm working directly with them on some of this, so I'm not going to overcommit. Is that a yes? <laughs> That's a no. Anyone else would like to be on a subcommittee? We can't make it unless we have... Like, we will meet with them individually, so I guess... Right. I think we need to talk to each other as well. All right, I'll, I'll get on it. Okay, great. So we've got Council Member Hyman, Council Member Williams, and Council Member Javier on a subcommittee. Um, and I'll defer to our staff for um, thoughts on what a staff analysis might be able to add to the conversation. I so you, you would like to, you all want to form a subcommittee. Who, who is it formally now? Councilmember Hyman, Councilmember Williams, and Councilmember Caballero have volunteered to be on a subcommittee. All right, thank um, you. Great, and um, yeah, if there, if our staff has any comments, um, we'd be excited to hear them. Otherwise, I think we're done. Okay, Madam Mayor. Thank you all. We had a great presentation. Great presentations. Great meetings. However, we are coming now to the closings because we have to go into closed session. So <clears throat> at this point, we'll turn to our clerk to hear about our boards and commission. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I have a few nominations here. The Durham Homeless Services Advisory Committee for the category of corporate private sector is Humphrey Truitt. Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee, category of arts and culture, Philip H. Kearney. For the category of facility management, Amit K. Singh. Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee, Mayoral Appointment, Finesse G. Coach. Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee Appointment, Jose E. Guerrero. 
and the Citizens Advisory Committee appointment, Sherrod Johnson. And that's the end of my report. All right, thank you so much, Madam Clerk. I'll turn now to our city manager um, so that we can settle our agenda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> For consent, I have items one through 44 and item 54, GBA item 55, and GBA public hearings, items 48 through 52. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Is there a motion to settle the agenda? So move. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilwoman uh, Freeman and seconded by Councilwoman Caballero. All those in favor, if you raise your left hand. That is a unanimous vote. All right, is there also a motion to adjourn to closed session at this Move. time? Second. All right. We are now, all those in favor, sign by saying aye. Aye. All right. We are in closed session. Madam Mayor, are we doing it? We will go upstairs and meet up there about Thank five you. minutes. Yeah. About five minutes. It's 5.55. Yeah.